Um, welcome to OzDocs, the Australian Documentary Forum. We're here for the Sydney launch of uh, the platform paper, which I'm guilty of. <laughs> um, and most important, the panel session on the feature documentary. And you're here, you're lucky to share with these people. Well, the panel will be sharing secrets, secrets with you, I hope, about what it takes to make a successful feature doc. And we've got, you know, an elite group here. Before I um, address some points in relation to the platform paper, um, I might just get um, Lucy from Currency House just to do a little intro. For the Currency House launch of Terms of Reference Platform Paper, The Changing Landscape of Australian Documentary, Currency House is a not-for-profit association, now 18 years old, formed to build better understanding and appreciation of the business and disciplines, uh, disciplines of the performing arts. Um, the platform papers are a quarterly series of single essays published since 2004, which give a voice to the workers in the field, musicians, designers, theatre makers, TV and filmmakers, choreographers, financiers, lawyers, who have a case to make. Uh, they cover everything from career-based issues to public policy, education, social welfare and racial equality. Uh, Tom, in his paper, has dived into the proud history of the independent documentary maker, whose story goes back to the 1896 Melbourne Cup and who, by risking life and limb, covered dramatic events <coughs> that have shaken our society, from the daily news to the war to world wars. Uh, digital technology changed those ways irrevocably and Tom writes powerfully about the threats and opportunities in this century which both defeat the strength of the individual and open new ways to survival. Uh, this evening is already, um, sorry, all the papers, uh, are, all the Currency House papers are available on our website, currencyhouse.org.au and can be purchased there with just a click and um, we also do subscriptions or sell them singly. Um, our forthcoming papers this year, uh, our next one is Nagara Baria, which means to listen to sing uh, Indigenous Music and the Australian Sound by Christopher Sainsbury, Capturing the Vanishing, a choreographer and film by Sue Healy, Cultural Criticism, Then and Now by Alison Crogan. First of all, thank you to Currency House and my editors, um, well, particularly Catherine from Brisbane and my editor Sandra Alexander and, Alexander and Nick Hurd. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, I, I did show the paper to a few people just prior to finishing it off, like you show a fine cut of a documentary. In fact, in many ways, I approached the writing of this as I would facing um, a huge number of rushes, like a six hour assembly, to try and get it down to um, what was eventually 15,000 words. I don't know how much that is equivalent in time, but it took me you know, a, a few months, a lot longer than I was actually expecting it to take, because there's just so much out there you can talk about in documentary, the whole history. And you know that in itself deserves uh, a publication. But I tried to kind of balance the history with um, um, the issues of the, of the present day, of which there are many, and I think I'll finish with some fairly strong points about that. Um, but um, in Melbourne we launched the paper down there, and um, John Hughes, a friend of mine, and I had this conversation at the launch, and he was saying, you, you know, your paper is remarkably agnostic. <laughs> I'm saying, you think? So yeah, you actually do. You know, give time to the people that make series, and you know, the the, the people that uh, um, in, are in the factual um, section, I guess you could say, of the industry, because there is this arbitrary distinction between factual and doc documentary, and unfortunately, the word factual has crept into the lexicon, and the word documentary has dropped out, which is a point that I refer to, and I think, which I think is a real pity. We should bring back documentary. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so it's kind of a snapshot of the industry. I'm fair to everybody, or try and be as factual as I possibly can. Um, but I'm also. <laughs> yeah, because I'm speaking as an independent filmmaker. I'm, I'm speaking from the heart. It, it is personal, 
Um, I do Excellent. have a few, a few anecdotes in there. <laughs> a creative interpretation of the <laughs> place. Right. Right. The creative interpretation of Yeah, well, yeah, it is. It is, I think. I think it's, it's, I think it's kind of nuanced. In that way, and a bit you know, sort of hard thought. I think that my love of Docker comes out, and um, my love of I think a lot of classic docs. I'm talk talking about docs that were made in the 20s and 30s, but in recent years, I mean, there's some several arts that make reference to. And I think there's a lot to be proud of. Um, and I also make reference to the campaigns. <laughs> you know, the campaigns that we had. Um, I mean, I've been around since the seventies making docs and you know starting off in small portback videos. But we had a particularly important campaign in the um, early eighties because none of the films we were making, which were funded by the Australian Film Commission, that was the, the only funding body at the time, and you could just apply to this one place <laughs> to film made. But there were some really fine films made. In fact, I remember David Bradbury made a film called Frankline. That film got an Academy nomination. Now, would the ABC buy it? No. Um, so, you know, this was just a starting point for many town hall meetings. And eventually they said, yeah, I guess you do, you know, we, you do deserve a place <laughs> on our national broadcasters. Uh, broadcaster, mind you, it was only ABC at the time, just before SBS. And um, so a few years later, we had this, um, well, we, we were get, beginning to go through a golden period where the ABC actually um, um, put into place what was called the Accord system, where there were accords between the funding body and the broadcaster, which entailed that broadcaster had to commission a certain minimum number of documentaries per year, and then the funding body would um, top up the funding to make a proper budget. And, and really, in over oh, probably 10 years from 95 to the mid noughties it was really the heyday of um, particularly the single documentary, where in one year as many as 60, the ABC bought, acquired, commissioned over 60 single documentaries. Um, you know, um, it's something that we, we shouldn't forget because, you know, we are in another campaign now to, to bring back the single hour. The single hour made about issues that are in the national interest. You know, and I'm, I must say, um, I don't know if many of you read the, um, there's an article in the paper, there was an efficiency review conducted of the ABC and the SBS <laughs> last week, and um, I don't have it here to quote, but they did make reference to, you know, all the, all the cooking shows and all the lifestyle shows, and questions whether, in fact, those were in the broadcaster's remit, cultural remit. Um, of course, they weren't. So we're using this, we're using a whole lot of facts and figures that we can bring to the attention of the funding bodies and the broadcasters to try and reassert the claim to single docs. Um, the other thing that, and one thing also that you have to remember that back you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was a different landscape in terms of where you can go to get your documentary funded. There were three organisations you know, funded by the government. There was, a strain, there was the AFC, Australian Film Commission, there was the Film Finance Corporation, and there was Film Australia. So you can go to one of those three bodies to, to, to try and, you know, um, um, spruik your project your commission, and, and be commissioned. And um, now it's just the one. Everything got collapsed into Screen Australia, the one funding body. And there's a, um, of course, if we all want to make films, so uh, many of the funding programs, all of them, have been very, very um, heavily subscribed. Um, and uh, I do feel for <laughs> the investment managers, mind you, it's, it's not an easy job. Um, I mean, there are issues that I want to go into in much in a lot of detail here, but um, maybe just I did uh, point to a, a, one of those things in the, in the platform paper. The fact that the broadcasters tend to be preferring very um, light products, commissioned formats. Um, you know, there was, in fact, in the guide, uh, um, one of the reviewers was um, referring to um, Escape from the City, is it, as being light and bright. And is that what 
the ABC should be commissioning, you know, should be funding, and you know, and then uh, information comes <laughs> comes through. That in fact, Fremantle Media has been uh, commissioned to make a hundred programs of this type, and the fact that okay, they bring in people from Britain to tell Australian producers what to do, just to make sure that the formats, you know, are in line with what they've uh, actually sold to the Australian broadcasters or the, the, the houses like Fremantle Media, which of course is international itself. But anyway, the other thing that happened around 2008 when Screen Australia was formed was um, up to nine um, production houses were given quite large sums of money to grow from being small and medium-sized enterprises to being quite big ones. Um, and of course, guess what they're making? These same very same formats. But to the exclusion of smaller companies, ones that uh, are represented by uh, filmmakers on this panel, you know, the cottage industry, which always existed prior to um, that point and still exists now, but we are really suffering. You know, it's really hard to um, run sustainable businesses. Um, so I did I was quite critical of that. Um, gee, where do we go from here? Hang on. Oh yes. Um, I talk about new platforms, and I acknowledge the fact that the broadcasters, um, even though we try and get them to commission more product, um, where the future lies is digital. And um, the fact that we've got Netflix beaming into um, 10 million Australian homes and that the Australian um, content on Netflix is less than 2%. And um, I strongly advocate in the paper that uh, um, documentary makers are joining forces with um, people, with other f filmmakers in drama, um, television, or advocating for quotas, quotas on s these large streaming platforms that have just sort of landed on our doorstep, not only to commission work, but commission work that's Australian and commission work from the very start. Sure, acquire product, but get involved in the early stages of Australian um, drama and documentary. Um, whether those documentaries are feature documentaries or whether they're documentary series, um, they should be involved there from the beginning and they should pay up. That in fact, um, a 15% quota is equivalent to something like $85 million that Netflix can inject into the Australian um, filmmaking industry as a whole. And a portion of that should, should go to documentary. And 85 million is about as much as Australia, Australia has. You know. It's, it's a, a sizable sum of money. And there's a, been a model for that, a Canadian model, where this is, this is happening, um, has happened already for a couple of years. And also in Europe, there's a quota. 30%. 30%, exactly. Anyway. I'm just pointing to a few things that are raised in, in the platform paper because I think a lot of these um, issues will be, that I've rehearsed will be discussed by our panel. Um, and I'll just say one more thing. Um, we've seen the rise of the feature documentary um, for, for a number of reasons. Cinema on demand, it's easier to, get to, to organise screenings, but it's, 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 it's also the fact that um, because there's not much scope on television anymore, you can't sustain your businesses making TV docs like you used to. You know, you have to make the feature. You have to make the feature. That's the only way to keep going. Um, I, f I feel for young, younger filmmakers, the emerging filmmakers that are starting, you know, their careers. It's it's very hard to. It's a lot easier to make you short. But what do you do after that? You know, but. 10, 15 years ago, you, 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 you made your one hour and got experience that way. And then you went on to possibly make a feature doc or you stayed making the one hour. Now you've got to make this huge transition between a 20-minute film and a feature film if you want to stay 
you know, if you want to be a documentary filmmaker, um, not working in the corporate space, of course, there's, that's a whole different ball game. There's plenty of work there. And there's also work, uh, um, f um, I'm sure you can work as a director for, for Fremantle Media and so many of the other companies that employ you as a director. In fact, some of our really named directors, like, uh, like Jen Pedham, was working as a director for hire by one of these companies. And then she said, look, sorry, Jen's not on the panel here, but I'm speaking for her. But she said, look, I'm sick of working for you. I'm going to develop my own film. And you know, she went on to now build a really substantial career. And this probably applies to some people on this panel. I, I mean, Kathy, you might have had this experience. But from <laughs> I've SBS. done everything. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. Um, OK, so let's talk about the feature doc. Um, we've got four people here on the panel who um, have recently made extremely successful docs in this space. Um, I've got Kathy Scott on my left, um, Nick Rothford at the end, um, uh, Madeleine Haverton, Rebecca Barry, um, and um, Anna Brunowski. Not in that order, so you have to work out who, who is who. There's <laughs> Nick. The <laughs> but, um, okay, Nick, Mad, Beck, Anna, and Cathy. Um, I feel like I want to lead off with um, Cathy, I don't know why, um, but I just, I mean, um, Backtrack Boys is sort of in the, in the zeitgeist. It's been incredibly successful. Um, who doesn't know about the film? Exactly, everybody does. One person put their hand <laughs> <up>. <laughs> It went down really fast. <laughs> I spat on a girl and I pissed on the courthouse. All of us boys have been in trouble with the law. Sleeping under bridges, burn out cars. I've had a pretty wild life. Growing up, it's just always betrayed that where you start is where you've got to finish. We've got three jobs. One is to keep the kid alive. Most of my family are alcoholics and that, and I just want to break the cycle in our family. The next is to keep them out of jail. Hey, shove your dog up your ass. Third thing is to chase their hopes and dreams. Build a few holes in the wall. How would it be if you kicked a hole in my wall while you were here? Because I'd probably get kicked out of backtrack. I'll tell you a secret. You can't get kicked out of backtrack. I've been to too many funerals of kids. I've had to visit too many kids in jail. A lot of people think it's too late, and it's never too late. Don't ever give up. We're not really broken, we're only bent. I want to be the young man that um, everyone thinks I am, you know? When shit gets hard, you know, it's these boys who are the ones there for me. Well, hello, madam. <laughs> We don't chase. This is a game of inches. I'm just too good looking to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kathy, I just want to ask you, how did you start the project? And, well, eventually, how did you raise the money? All right. Um, look, I just want to set backtrack. I think. Um, we're in a bit of an unfortunate situation because not every documentary is a feature documentary and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Having a cracking good one hour or even a half hour documentary is just as great. And I think, um, so for me, I, 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 you know, I think there's two different kinds of feature documentaries, by the way, like often what we used to do in the days when we got pre-sales from broadcasters is we'd make a a feature length documentary, maybe 75, maybe 80 minutes, depending. I mean, Anna's different because she's always sort of gone out in a very different way. And then we would, do, we would go to festivals like Scarlet Road, who I, who I made, um, made that with uh, Pat Fisk. So we did our festival version and it went to say 40 film festivals around the world. And then we would sell the one hour to um, TV broadcasters. So actually our end goal for that um, film was actually television but we used the sort of festival circuit to sort of get the sales, to get the um, articles and the publicity that then generated that and also got people to tune in and watch it and things like that. So that's one kind of feature film, which I think 
you, you know, works really well. And in fact, um, with Netflix, you're, you're, still, you're sort of seeing that. Like, people are going to the, the festival circuit and they're going to these big festivals like Sundance or South by Southwest or, you know, Tribeca or whatever. And then they get picked up and then they literally show in a few locations, not many. And then they're going and they get broadcast sometimes at the same time as the cinema release on Netflix. And so there's, a, there's all these different ways of, um, of how feature films are evolving and how they reach their audiences. Um, in Australia, we're sort of in a really traditional um, model. And so with Backtrack Boys, I, I took a very different path from Scarlet Road. Didn't have a pre-sale even um, possible because um, I had a film that the broadcasters um, did not want. Um, at that time, so I had to sort of uh, a, a go. Now, originally, to, to, just to backtrack a little bit, um, I was originally going to do that this film as a half hour because when I heard about this story, I thought that would make a great half hour. I was thinking so, and when I um, and I was going to do it, and I was all set to go and do it, and then it, it fell over and it didn't happen, and I decided to to sort of stuff it and go anyway, and went on the road with them and. Um, and when I was so glad I got turned down because when I got up there, I realised that um, actually this was actually a really good feature doc because I had all these young people. First of all, they were extraordinary ca characters. They were incredibly amazing. They were willing to open up and really in a very short amount of time, they were telling me everything. I was filming everything. I was getting really that kind of intimacy and access that often you would have to really struggle and negotiate over a long period of time or whatever, I was getting it instantly, probably because of the way the whole thing happened by me not getting this half hour up. And because um, and, we kind of bonded over that. And then uh, I could also see in a very short amount of time that there was a lot of transformation happening with the characters, you know. And one of the things that I think is the difference between sort of a shorter documentary and a longer documentary is you have to have some kind of transformation of, of character. Uh, with Scarlet Road, actually, I think the transformation happens with the audience, not so much with the characters. But with uh, Backtrack Boys, it was definitely um, there was a lot of happening. There was a lot of, in fact, we almost had too many, you know, too much drama. There was like people coming and going and going in and jail and out of jail. It was almost too much. We was like, oh, you know, all right already. Um, so that, so I think, to, you know, at, we're filmmakers. We've got to start talking stories and and not content and not product. I think we've got to go back to stories and what is the best place of this? Where is this story best suited? And um, so I think before people start going, oh, let's just make a, a, a feature doc because that's the only place where the money is, I think that's not necessarily going to lead you to success. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say on that. Um, with Backtrack Boys, I was very lucky. I do consider there's video gods and like somehow you stumble across these amazing characters and all these things start happening and you just think, how lucky am I? Um, and then you just have to try your best to fund it. Now, luckily, because there is the producer fund and I'm, I had a lot of support um, with the Documentary Australia Foundation. So have, are you all familiar with the Documentary Australia Foundation? Is everybody, anybody not familiar with it? So you're all familiar. So I don't, I don't need to go into it, but obviously they are there to help um, connect filmmakers with philanthropic um, foundations and individuals so we can fund our films that way. So luckily they came on board as a sort of, um, as an executive producer and they helped raise the money. So instead of going to a broadcaster to get a pre-sale, which is what we used to do in the old days, which was like, you know, 10 years ago or seven years ago even, um, uh, I, I sort of did that and um, and we were very lucky. We got a lot of people um, very interested and so we could raise our budget for that. So look, the one thing that, um, that's wonderful about DAF is that it, it, it's not just in terms of the, the wonderful thing about sort of working with them and I know um, Rebecca has done this as well, is that it's not just about raising money to, to the production monies to make your film, it's also about getting your film out to your audiences. So you kind of work in two ways. You sort of raise to raise the money, but you also are working with them to reach your audiences in sort of interesting and dynamic ways, sort of around impact screenings and things like that. So that, that was a very big part of what I did. So 
Anyway, I got all the deals up and I just have to say, I wish I knew um, then what I know now about distribution and cinema distribution. And it and it's even very different now to say when Anna did her Forbidden Lies film. We've often talked about how it's a really changing environment, how people often, Netflix has been fantastic because more people are watching um, documentaries than ever before. In fact, I just read an article and in fact, uh, at Sundance, documentaries got picked up. They spent got $20 million was spent on acquisitions of documentary at Sundance alone. That's not even including the other festivals. And they got more pick up than um, the dramas. So, you know, this is a, a really interesting moment. So there's a lot of stuff going on like that. And we're being told by our broadcasters that people don't want documentaries. So we're going, OK, they must be we must be living on a different planet. But anyway, I think that might be about that might be changing because I think there's some people um, who are really trying to open up some documentary slots in the public broadcasting. So that will be a really exciting change if that could happen. Um, so just for me, I, I think there's another big issue in terms of documentary. So I raised the money, I got Umbrella, we had to negotiate, you have to, in order to uh, qualify for um, feature funding, you, documentary funding, you have to show a pathway to audience. And believe me, they're really rigorous on this, and I think rightly so. Um, because you really do have to think about how you're going to get your film out there. And it's not just as simple as getting a distribution, a, a dis distribution company and just putting it in a cinema. It's actually really hard to get people into the cinemas to watch documentaries. So you have to be quite dynamic. You have to hold events. Um, you have to, try, you know, obviously getting into the festival circuit can really help. Uh, but you have to do you have to be really creative um, and work with like key target communities. One of the things that we did, um, was that we um, we teamed up with RSPCA and we had some special screenings with them, um, and then they t then they were going to help get the word out to all their people. We had other special um, influencer influencer screenings with other people um, through the Backtrack Network, you know, youth organisations and, and foundations and people that fund that sort of stuff to try and get the work out. There was a lot of there's a lot of organisations out there that fund sort of um, sort of social issues and they're sort of like Macquarie banks and all these different people who are really into getting the word out and it really is those those people can come to you and deliver a lot like we ended up partnering with a organisation called Unlimited and they basically are a non profit that brings together media advertising people that want to work around youth issues and they secured with one of their um, members which was called phd two million dollars in marketing for our film so we, we had like um billboards we had electronic billboards and companies if people were sending us things in fact i should have brought clips of this but like people were filling up their petrol tanks and in gas stations and they have like videos there now and now trail that trailer was playing at the gas pump the 15 second one actually that not that one and um and you know there was other place where we had you had mirrors and bathrooms and as you walk to the mirror to wash your hands there's like it, the trailer comes up on the thing like because people were trying out all of they had all this sort of all the space that they didn't want they sort of give to to sort of charities or non-profits and so because we were working with backtrack we kind of slipped in on that, and it was really amazing. Sort of, um, and we got free. We had an ad on Channel Ten. That when the royal family was out, we got a like quarter page ad. This was none of we didn't pay for this. This was all sort of through this um, partner called Unlimited, who had, and they put out um, all this amazing um, uh, articles and um, different ads that were in all the regional papers. All we give them a list every week when we were because we were in about a hundred cinemas around Australia, and it would vary week to week. So some weeks it'd be forty cinemas, and then the next week twenty more would take it here. And we would give them a list every week saying this is the places where all the cinemas um, that are taking it. And then they would literally go out to all of the their, their newspapers and they'd either run an article or they'd run the ad or they'd do all of the above. And so people knew it was actually in the cinema. And then I actually hired an ex-student of mine and, and, I, and we, uh, we would see all the locations that um, it was in and then we'd, get, we'd call up all the dog groups, like sort of the therapy dog groups, the youth organisations, the teachers organisations, because a lot of teachers um, groups, that psychologist groups and things like that. Um, DAF and uh, we had this amazing impact producer who's here. Where are you, Lisa? Is Lisa? Oh, there she is. So Lisa was really instrumental. She ran this incredible social media campaign with Shelley 
and they did all we created some assets and um, like all different kinds of excerpts of the film and we were doing and we grew our social media in like three weeks from it was like 300 when we began and it became like three and a half thousand in like two weeks just from their incredible and it's still growing now it just keeps going so we've been in over a hundred cinemas and we currently got we had a by the end of our festival run, we had 250 requests for community screenings, of which we, we joined up with Fanforce to then flick, try and flick many of those over right now. So I think we've got about 50 screenings happening now. So And it just keeps rolling over. So I just want to say one thing. So they measure our performance through the box office. So, so when we get Fanforce screenings or we do a regular cinema release, that's all measured because you can count through the box office. But when we do our community screenings, we just basically sell a license fee. Now, usually it's around 300, but if people don't have money, it's less. Sometimes it's for free. It just depends. And so we're trying to find a way to measure those community screenings and impact screenings, because what we're trying to also push is that it's great that these films can make money and it's great to show that they're, um, bus they're commercially viable, but also we need to be able to measure um, the this, this sort of um, social capital, if you will, that um, these films produce and, and sort of impact around them. So that's the sort of main thing I'd like to sort of put out. I don't want to take too much time, but just one more quick thing I just want to say is that with all these streams, everyone's going, oh, it's really exciting. And, you know, everyone's like, we're fighting to sort of get our, our spaces back on the ABC and SBS. And everyone's going, but who cares? No one's watching, um, you know, no one's watching, um, looking like if you look for a documentary, you're not really going to go to the ABC anymore. They kind of lost that credibility. Everyone just goes straight to Netflix. And that's great. Um, and there's potential there, especially if we can get the quotas. But, you know, what also comes with that is um, this whole you have to have films that are internationally relevant. And that's great. Many of our films, I've often worked on very international films, partly because I've spent a lot of time not living in Australia. So I'm, I've always had that sort of, I've always been like that. In fact, probably backtracks the one first film I've really, really super Aussie film I've ever made. Um, but we've also got to find a balance because we have to find ways that in this global world that we live, it's great that we want to do those big stories that everyone can relate to around the world, but we also have to make sure we're doing the, the stories that are just about us as well. So Backtrack sort of won audience awards at numerous film festivals in Australia and it's done really well, but we have not been picked up by one international film festival, which is quite astounding, I think, because um, I think it's the best film I've made ever, so I'm a bit sort of like, how come all other films have gone well in those spaces and not, I mean, I shouldn't say that, it's not the best film, it's one of, yeah, it's equal to Scarlet Road. But, um, but yeah, I just think that, you know, every film has its own life and it all, each film has a different path. And so, you know, Scarlet Road did really well overseas, this, it, but this one's doing a lot better here. So you, I think we've got also got to f figure out a way to make sure we, keep telling our Australian stories and not lose that because it's very we've got a very precious culture we've got a very precious place and we have to make sure we keep seeing ourselves reflected back and we're not just you know we're not I hate us all to be sort of feel like you know we already watch a little bit too much of America and Trump and tune into that I think we should just be tuning into a little bit more stuff around us as well and so we've got to find I think with all these battles around quotas and spaces and stuff like to me I, I'm all about story and I want us to have as many places where we can go with our international stories but our local stories and find the balance there totally. I'll leave it at that fantastic <laughs> I want to pass on to um, Nick Roffel um, who's this, this is Nick, it's your second film, isn't it? The first one you made was Gore Vidal, the United States of Amnesia. Well, second big feature, anyway. <laughs> um, now, this one's Undermined, Tales from the Kimberley. Um, I was actually involved as an executive producer on this one, but um, Nick uh, got the whole thing going. It's, uh, it followed a slightly different path from um, Backtrack Boys, but it, there's also a about a different sort of story and um, maybe one that was possibly a little bit more overtly issue-based and political um, in, in that real sense. 
because it was about what was get, what's going on in the Kibbe at the moment, the, the pressures of development, mining and uh, agriculture, big agriculture. So let's play the trailer. Thanks, Alan. I was born on Fossil Down Station, where my ancestors came from. I grew up very much one with the land, a very, very beautiful life. We've shared this land with everybody, with generous spirit, despite the atrocities that have happened. I was brought up on the cattle station here, and I've worked in the pastoral game for many years. One big jump. Good boy. You're sitting here in Billionaires Row, you have Kerry Stokes on one side and Gina Ridehan on the other. The government is not seeing the big picture that this place is one of the most special on the planet. We've announced uh, more than $650 million in roads, water and other infrastructure in the north. And that rhetoric of jobs, jobs, jobs is an illusion. How are we as Australians letting our country be developed? To whose benefit, to whose interest? We're being used. We either had to take the deal or suffer the consequences of losing any sort of capacity to control the development. Someone is going to mine that country. Surely we can get some local people trained up into that. But it's a 47 year mine life. It's an intergenerational opportunity. Please, can you just speak to us like we actually have half a brain? People say, get away from them as quick as you can. Be aware. Seriously, be aware. They cut all phone lines. One of them come with an axe. It's usually a fairly aggressive approach to when they try to run and take over things. I don't know what can happen, man. Why do so many Kimberley children feel that the only option they have is to take their own life? They've been burnt that many times that that's all they've seized. There's no future for them. Town life is not good for any Aboriginal. We want to go back home. Aboriginal Australia doesn't want to go into your backyard. It doesn't want to disturb you. It doesn't want to exploit your resources or your privacy or your, your inheritance. Aboriginal people don't want to do that to white Australia. Whereas every single day, Aboriginal people are facing that dilemma. So we want to have a really meaningful conversation about this. Give it time and we wonder why, do what we can. Laugh and we cry. <laughs> so Undermined has had a, a cinema run across Australia. But Vic, maybe before we talk about that, I'd like you to talk about that and uh, how that's gone on. Um, but just that very early stage of how you got the f idea and how you managed to put together a very complex funding package. and. What happened is, you know, how that sort of went on and maybe unfolded a bit towards the end. Sure. Um, <laughs> Don't keep any secrets now. <laughs> Tom knows a few of the, the secrets. Um, yeah, the film came from, uh, I'm not sure if Steph's here, actually, my co-producer. Yay. So we uh, met around the time that the... Um, Federal and Western Australian state government were talking about making major cuts to remote indigenous communities, cutting their funding, looking at amalgamating a lot of communities in the north, especially in Western Australia and the Kimberley. And Tony Abbott made his famous statement about not supporting people's lifestyle choices to live in those mm -hmm. communities. And there was a lot of protests in all the major cities. And um, <coughs> I guess we started talking about it then and we're looking at what the real story behind the headlines was. And that, um, that's where we started. And, and we, we managed to get a very small amount of uh, development funding from Screen Australia. And we went up there for about a month and we started talking to people on the ground there. And we were working with a local cinematographer, Mark Jones, who's from Broome. And we had a few contacts. Steph had been up there before working on the uh, Indigenous Dental Health documentary with the Charlie Perkins Foundation. And we got involved right away pretty much with CALAC, with the Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre that became kind of our, we formed, we've had an MOU with them around cultural issues, but they also became kind of our cultural advisors, as well as working with Steve Kinane and Albert Wigan, who's in the film. And we just started listening to the stories that people had and 
Mark, who works up there as a cameraman, knew a lot of people too. And the story seemed to be about <coughs> development, that the pressures on communities, well, a lot of it was about development, was about opening up the land and promoting developing the north. So that became the story that we followed. And we started talking to a lot of different people across different communities. We were invited to some of the peak cultural events there and the AGMs of the Kimberley Land Council and CALAC and the other peak groups and talking to elders but also just talking to people on the ground in communities in the towns about the issues <coughs> they faced and you know we had so many stories after this month or two of development we managed to get a little bit more development money from Screen West and we went back up and we put together a trailer and to be honest, at that point, we, we didn't really have uh, the stories that ended up in the film determined. We had a lot of the beginnings of different stories. We, I think we'd pretty much decided Albert was going to be one of the key characters. Um, and we weren't sure who the other key stories would be because we were following a lot of different stories and keeping in touch with a lot of different people. And then um, as we started to the second phase of development with the Screen West money, Kevin's story, who you see briefly in the trailer, uh, Cattle Station, it started to sort of unfold in front of our eyes as he got involved in a joint venture with an outside company and we could see the sort of forces of development working on the ground with our characters as in front of our eyes. So we started following him a bit more closely and then another one of the stories that came out in the edit was the river. Obviously the river is a big focus of development up there and there'd been other problems with development of, of water resources around the Ord in the Northern Kimberley in the past. And we could see, and people were worried that a similar thing might happen in the Fitzroy Basin around the Fitzroy. And obviously, you know, we all see the pressures in the Murray-Darling region and we're aware that this could be a sort of ec ecological disaster up there as well. And so people are very concerned on the ground about that. And it kept coming up about protecting the river. And so that became another one of our focuses. And I guess that's a long-winded version of how we began. Um, as far as the, the, the funding, we got a little bit of development money, as I mentioned, from Screen Australia and then Screen West. And, and Screen Australia were very supportive of the idea and of, of us in the filmmaking from the beginning. I think um, you know, there are films made up in the Kimberley. There's been a few great documentaries made up there. Tom can vouch for that firsthand. Um, but a lot of the stories up there are very regional and they don't make it out of the region, I think. People like Galari Media up there are doing a lot and there's a lot on Indigenous television in the region, but there isn't much sort of reaching the, the big cities and the East Coast of what, what's really going on up there. And anyway, we managed to, we applied through the producer, uh, as for a grant through the producer offset scheme and we managed to get Umbrella Entertainment on board as a theatrical distributor very early on and they were supportive and could see the potential of a sort of politically charged uh, ecological big feature doc that it would have appeal with the you know the, the lefties I suppose and <laughs> so we managed to tick the offset boxes uh, it wasn't easy we were knocked back at least once and uh, and then we borrowed, we, we got a big, a small grant from Screen Australia and we borrowed against the offset. We managed to get Screen West on board after some knockbacks as well. They were very concerned uh, about the political nature and criticising mining and development, which is a, obviously a big agenda for Western Australia. And they did eventually come on board and um, then we managed to get uh, some money from Screen New South Wales and we had a foreign uh, sales interested at one point, which never really eventuated, but it was on our finance plan at one point. And then when we were in the, in the edit, we managed to get some finishing funds from MIF Premier Fund, where we premiered the film at the Melbourne Film Festival. We also reinvested all of our fees into the finance plan to reach the offset level because we, we couldn't get there and we, we were trying to make this film and um, the only way we could make the, 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 the finance plan work was to reinvest all of our own fees. So we were basically making the film for, for free over a three year period. And um, you know, that was, it's difficult making this type of film, I have to say. There, there wasn't a lot of uh, interest from broadcasters. We, d we, d we did have an ongoing conversation with 
SBS, which is still ongoing and we're hoping to get an acquisition. But I guess we felt passionate and the people up there felt passionate and Screen Australia and some of our supporters could see you know, what we were trying to do. And so we, we sort of soldiered on and decided to put our money where our, our mouth was, I guess, and just keep going. And, and that's how we put the finance plan together. It's been a very tricky couple of years. Luckily, we did have a lot of support in the region from people on the ground there. They could see after a while, after we were showing them what we were doing, that we were really trying to let them tell their stories and that we were trying to tell a very contemporary story about where the region is now and where it's potentially going and what could potentially be lost if it's not protected and if the development's done in a sort of unfettered way that's being proposed. So we formed really good alliances up there and we managed to work with people uh, we, even with our cameraman who, you know, would wait to get paid or would waive his fees or throw his car in or, you know, things like that to help us keep going. Um, yeah, that's how we put those elements together. Well, I think that your um, a story is... It, it was a very difficult paid. film to make, yes. you know. And, I was going to say, um, your story is very, very typical of people that are trying yeah. to make features and working with the offset. You end up invest, reinvesting a huge num amount of your fees into the film. I'm sure. I'm sure other filmmakers go through similar things, and yeah. no doubt, it's it's a difficult it's, industry making documentaries. Um, mm. But you know, we sort of stuck at it, and now the film's in cinemas around Australia. You know, it has been for the last couple of weeks. Um, we've had amazing press response. Uh, uh, we've had a lot of people very interested in the film now that it's done. We premiered at the Melbourne Film Festival, had incredible premiere there, and played. Um, you know, film festivals around Australia, including winning the Audience Award at the Antenna Film Festival in Sydney. So, you know, we can see that people appreciate hearing these Australian stories that mm -hmm. are really hard to eke out and I think are important for decision making and for cultural awareness and awareness of where the country's going. So we feel, you know, vindicated that we sort of stuck to our guns with the film and I guess we're on a similar model in a way fan force is getting involved and we're trying to build uh, you know regional interest we're getting a lot of regional interest and community interest to show the film we've already taken it up to the Kimberley and done community screenings up there in November which we managed to do off our own back out of, we did raise a little bit of money with DAF um, uh, we, D Mitzi became involved as a, as a an executive producer, as did Tom and also Josh Pomerantz, who uh, helped us financially through Spectrum Films with the post side of, of the, the deals we made with him, some reinvestment deals. So, you know, we're hoping the film has a continued life. We're certainly working really hard um, to bring it to, out through Fanforce to regional areas and communities. And, it, and it's had a, a decent run for a few weeks now in all the capital cities around Australia. I, I don't think we've got it into Darwin yet for some reason or Adelaide but it's been playing in, in Fremantle, in Perth, in Broome, in Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Brisbane and so on and, and been very well received and it's still playing in Western Australia and the press like I said has been good and I think in Western Australia in particular it's, it has been uh, really in the zeitgeist of the discussion. I know Albert who's in the film did television there a lot of, I did a lot of radio stuff with him and he's done radio and there's been articles in all the major papers, Sydney Morning Herald, Age, Australian and the Western Australian and other regional papers as well as film press. So I feel like, you know, we've sort of achieved what we'd hoped as far as getting the story out uh, as an initial phase and now we're hoping to get it out eventually with a television sale and through fan force with um, community and uh, regional bookings in a similar model to Backtrack. Thanks Nick. Fantastic. And now it's over to Madeline and Beck. Um, now, I just want to, I'm sure most people here know um, or have heard of Media Stockade. Well, you've got the co-founders here. Um, Madeline, my left, and um, on her right is Beck. And... Um, well, you've got a great CV, the two of you. Fantastic. I mean, with um, I'm a Girl, Back and uh, Surgery Ship, which is mm. mostly your production, Madeline, and, uh, which has done so well and 
has become an eight-part series from an original feature, hasn't it? Um, but um, I'm going to be asking you to talk about China Love, principally, but also how to how to build audiences for films, for your films, because you've been very, very successful doing that with all your films. And I can't forget, of course, the very controversial film, The Opposition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't particularly want you to talk about it because you talked about that in other, other Osdox events. <laughs> but, so let's mainly talk about China Love, but just generally about the company, how, how you're working, you know, as a small, very small company, there's only really three, three of you. Um, no, there's not, Tom, there's five. There's no, five? Some people part time. Um, <laughs> but, hey, but, 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 but before you do, before you do, let's let's have China Love trailer, please. Until recently, marriages in China were arranged by the family or state. They were documented with just one passport-style photo. We haven't actually set a date. I want to have wedding photos under the water. You know, in the weekend. <laughs> Pre-wedding photos are taken up to a year in advance. They get to dress up. They get to play out their fantasy. Getting a bit emotional now. How much do you spend on the photos? It wouldn't be that much, I don't think. Did it. Did it. Oh, come on, you have to keep this one. No, I don't like this one at all. Every day, we have 2,000 customers. He's the wedding king, the godfather of the wedding industry. You know, he sells happiness. It's not just a business, it's like a world. Wedding, wedding, wedding! There's a huge amount of pressure still on young people to marry. She threatened me multiple times, okay? Lonely life forever, ever, ever. If you don't marry for a life, you will not be able to marry a society. Yes. Look at this. Chinese woman just betrayed all of us and told the world the truth. Sorry, I got so emotional. Oppressed for so long, and suddenly freedom and the money to pursue these things. Nobody even could dream about it 30 years ago. To photograph yourself, to do a proper wedding photo 60 years later, it shows older family members who lived through hell. Look how far we've come. Look at us now. So Media Stockade um, is Beck and I really and we founded it in 2012 and largely got together because we were feeling probably some of the frustrations that are still very current today about finding it difficult to access funding through broadcast to, or really anywhere actually and um, and then since that time we've actually I've just counted we've actually made six feature documentaries um, not all of them have been fit for feature like purposed for feature some of them have grown out of TV commissions and I think three of them have been kind of straight had to be feature commissions Bex I'm a Girl China Love was spent funded through a feature documentary program um, and the opposition was always intended as a feature so um, and I guess, look, we've had a really different journey on each one of those films and the experiences on this panel touch, I think, a lot of the experiences, but they're not always the same. And I, I suppose I wanted to reiterate Cathy's opening comments about not every story needs to be a feature. Not that it's not worthy of a feature, but stories can work at almost every length. And China Love is a feature film and it's been on a cinema on demand distribution in um, Australia. It's, it's travelling very well in festivals internationally. It's had a successful run on ABC Arts as a cut down to a 52 minute. But to be honest, the, the most successful piece of media that has come out of China Love is a small clip. 90 that's, seconds. That's just hit 2 million views on, on social. Facebook. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, when I think one of the, t if I could make any generalisation about the business of feature film, it would be that stories can be told at all kinds of lengths and they will find a different audience at different lengths. And actually, really, the task of a filmmaker is to get your story to those different audience pick up points and that will probably involve more than one way of doing it um, and China Love is a really good example of what's happening with that film. Mm. Um, shall I talk about the funding? Mm, yeah. just, just to give you some nuts and bolts on the funding. So um, uh, uh, China Love came to us um, through 
first time filmmaker. We work a lot with first time filmmakers, Olivia Martin Maguire, talent spotted by Madeline at an afters <laughs> course here. Mads comes back to the office and said, there was this great project pitch. It's about the pre-wedding photography business in China. And I just went, are you sure about that? Sounds like a... Sounds like a Facebook. tough one. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a Facebook yeah, Page. clip. Um, yeah. In joke. Um, and, um, and uh, but, you know, obviously got captivated by the subject matter and really believed in Olivia's vision. She's a photographer... So, um, you know, has an extraordinary eye and we kind of knew that this was something that we could, someone and, and a subject matter that we could work with. Uh, we got um, some Screen Australia development money um, to create our pitch materials. So we created a trailer and a treatment that took a year. And then um, when we kind of had those tools in hand, we then went the traditional route and started having the discussion with ABC Arts and um, really we're having some kind of informal discussions. Mandy Chang was there at the time and, um, you know, they liked it, um, but it wasn't until we got selected for the AIDC pitch forum uh, and we pitched the project, um, Mads and Olivia pitched the project and it was received really well. And I think the energy in the room and the positive reinforcement from the international <laughs> people really pushed ABC Arts um, you know, to, to the commission. Uh, and then they also suggested that we apply to the ABC Arts Create New South Wales Documentary Feature Fund. Um, and we were successful getting that. So um, we actually did get one of those very rare one hours. And I have to say, I do, um, I do think ABC Arts, uh, you know, really punch above their weight in terms of the one hours. They are actually one place where they the they have a remit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the only place really, um, apart from a few little tiny little um, areas that are, are, are taking the chance and also taking risks, like really risky subject matters, like this one, like crazy kooky pre-wedding photography in China. Who would have thought? Um, and look, we always did see the potential for cinema because the... The, the, if you've seen the film, you know, the vistas and the photography and Olivia's eye, um, you know, really does lend itself to the big screen. Um, then, of course, in terms of the funding, we got, um, we got uh, obviously ABC Arts, we got a pre-sale, we got the Create New South Wales, and then we got the producer fund at Screen Australia. And then we thought, given our um, our pedigree uh, of um, releasing cinema, uh, you know, films in the cinema, uh, we've had a pretty good track record independently doing a hybrid distribution release. We um, thought that we'd go in for the 40% offset. Also, we were funded under a feature documentary fund. Yes. So the, just actually, we should just quick check, who has made a feature film using Quape or Pep? production funding. Is everyone like mostly, from, well, maybe we should just quickly run through There's sort of two pathways for filmmaking in Australia. There's the producer equity program, which basically kind of um, applies to films with $500,000 budgets or less. And then there's the QUAIP, the Qualifying Australian Production Expenditure Fund, which deals with films that are $500,000 budgets and up. And depending on where your budget range falls, you'll fall into one of those two kind of pathways if you're going to be using Screen Australia funding. And that's actually a subject of a lot of debate and we'll probably get into that, well we will get into that on China mm -hmm. Love because it affected us a great deal as to what actually happened with us. To be it, the PEP and QUAPE for documentaries are the same, 20% of your budget. But if you are releasing a theatrical film, drama or documentary, you can get 40% QUAPE. So you have to be in the above $500,000 range. but if you're doing a theatrical release, you can get more money for it, which you need because you're doing a theatrical release and it's more a more ambitious kind of um, distribution ask on your budget. So given that we were funded under the feature film bun and we were making a feature film that would premiere at Sydney Film Festival and so on, we applied for the quote for the 40%. I'll hand back to Beck. <laughs> yes, and unfortunately we didn't get it um, and there are some you know, lots of toing and froing about why that was. So we ended up doing very similar mm. thing of um, we, we just had to press go on this because we had a deadline. There's a wedding season in China and we just had to cash flow basically. Um, so we actually reinvested our fees back into um, the, the, the film, um, which is going to pay off. 
I'm very determined. So we're going for our final certification for 40% uh, in, the, in this month, actually. Um, but I guess the, um, the point about that was that um, you know, even though it had been endorsed by the ABC, they, they wanted us to make a feature. Create New South Wales wanted us to make a feature. The production round wanted us to make a feature at Screen Australia. It wasn't sort of seen as a sort of a legitimate pathway down for the 40 percent largely because our theatrical was still going yeah and because we didn't have it we decided to go down um a cinema on demand um route because we felt we had the skills and the impact we impact produce for other people we were part of the embrace impact team that made over a million dollars at the box office um and we impact we help you know other filmmakers with their impact strategies as well um so I guess that's how we funded it. Um, and then do you want to, should mm. we talk about the release and the distribution? Mm. Do you want to talk about yeah. that? So we had, a, obviously there's sort of like st- uh, stages to a release. So the initial part was the feature premiere at Sydney Film Festival, which was really lovely and um, got some great press and a really um, two lovely sold out home crowds because Sydney kind of based production team and, um, and people came. Um, and then we rolled out through um, through the cinemas. So that was um, Sydney Film Festivals in June. We went out in September to December last year. Um, as part of that, we um, with with our um, cinema on demand platform, Demand Films, uh, brought on board a sort of specialised Chinese um, audience marketer. They also have a um, a um, press person on retainer so there was quite a you know there were a few people around to help us kind of um, promote the film through sort of the specialized audiences that we thought it would appeal to which was Chinese diaspora photography particularly wedding photography and then documentary lovers um, and so that um, was our cinema and demand release um, I mean Beck's written at the top of your cinema and demand is not easy yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when um, Tom in trade he said oh, you know cinema on demand is easy yeah. it's not easy I think we can all say that if you if you're releasing a film in the cinema and you're not with one of the big one of the bigger distribution companies it is just a lot of hard work and it's mm. and it is on the phones it is you know I think for one screening up in Brisbane you sent about 300 I think that was the record 300 emails to people to get them to come along so that we could tip this screening it is it is not easy you know the time cost analysis on it is you know woeful um, but you do you do get mm. it does it does feed and give life to the film um but i guess i guess the way we kind of think about this film i mean we did make it primarily as a feature it's also a tv one hour uh we're also about to release a book of olivia's photography um and then off the back of you know some really really viral um you know smaller clips of which have been viewed by the most people around the world Mm. 2.1 million um, on the Facebook post, which is a record for ABC Arts as well. And we also had some viral um, social clips on WeChat because that's where the Chinese diaspora hangs out on a lot on. Um, you know, we sort of see the whole thing as part of an ecosystem of, you know, where will eventually we get our fees back and, you know, where will we eventually you know make a money but we're also now looking at potentially you know because we can see that there's a lot of you know these little gorgeous little clips they're like little gems i mean they're not i mean they're still they're really short films but now we can see the potential and um, we were invited to pitch in guangzhou last year an online series because over in china you know everybody's watching everything they don't actually have you know a documentary sort of culture over there um, so it's all part of the ecosystem. Like we just don't look at the film as just a feature. It's like a whole mm. number of different pu- pieces to the puzzle to make up what this project, what this project is. Um, and in fact, that's sort of been a case for a number of films. So um, the Surgery Ship was a single film that was commissioned from SBS in 2013, which we also did make into a feature and then re-pitched back into National Geographic and it became an eight by one hour series. And, you know, stories, if they're good story worlds, you know, they will grow and kind of flourish in many ways. And so, I mean, it was really fun to actually go back to the surgery ship and make it into an eight hour series because there was so much in there that you couldn't, you just can't stuff into one film. And then we got like eight hours to kind of really explore a whole bunch of things within there. And, um, and so, 
I guess you know, um, like we're in this funny phase in the, in in our, kind of the filmmaking culture where technology has given us the resources, the cameras, like accessible editing programs to allow us to kind of make things. And there is actually, in the last few years, this resurgence of interest in documentary via um, SVOD platforms particularly. But there's this real squeeze in the middle about how to actually fund the things in any way approaching, like a, a, even approaching a sustainable kind of life. And so that's kind of where the, where the struggle is going on. Uh, at the same time, expectations about the quality of craft and storytelling are very high, and as they should be, actually. So there are some things you just simply can't do for free. Like, you just cannot deliver to a cinema quality f film on no money. Like, the post-production just simply will cost quite a chunk of money, even if you don't value your time. And we do value our time, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so should you, actually, as well. So it's, like, complicated times but and very shifting currents in terms of what's going on um, as well. And then just, just to add just two more things, just with the funding, I should also add that we also had a post-production deal. Um, with Cutting Edge, who um, came on board as an executive producer. So that's kind of sometimes a really great way to, um, you know, get um, your, uh, close your finance gap. Um, and then I guess in terms of funding for our other films, this one was a bit more traditional in that it did have TV broadcast. But in our other films, our other film that we that's out at the moment, Power Mary, that also had a lot of philanthropy and, you know, we're also using... Um, the wonderful, extraordinary Documentary Australia Foundation mm -hmm. um, as uh, as part of our, you know, blueprint, I guess, when we're thinking about where we're going to get funding from. On In, that, should mm. we just sort of... One thing um, that Nicholas was talking about was um, when you're... And Cathy knows all about this too, which is that when you are using Cinema Demand, you are looking for partnerships that can come in, and even if they can't support you financially in terms of direct funding to your film, will come on board in some way in terms of advertising, sponsorship, or just simply people that will be organising hosts. And um, that can work incredibly well with some films like Embrace, which had this extraordinary kind of Cinema Demand delivery, one of the most <laughs> successful documentary, or possibly the most successful documentary that year in cinemas. It, it really grossed over a million in the box office. It did extremely yeah. well. But it, it had managed to kind of ignite this flame of interest from lots of s small kind of hosts that would kind of just bring their 30 or 40 friends to a cinema to watch a film. Um, otherwise, if you can find bigger partners that can help support your film, that's also an amazing resource. With Power Mary, it's a film about football, so we're um, working with the NRL and their kind of club base to get them to request screenings. But above all, those partnerships take a great deal of time, you know, like six to 12 months minimum to actually really, really get them engaged. And, and of all the people that will put their hand up to potentially be a partner, maybe one in 20 will actually be an effective partner because it's a stretch for them too. You know, it's not quite in their zone of what they do. So they you really need to find that visionary inside that organisation or company that will really want, gets fired up by the idea of, yes, documentary, let's go support a documentary film. So even though the philanthropic model is there, it's not an easy substitution for the broadcaster pre-sale, which has been the other model, or even the yeah. video on demand kind of offering that Netflix and Hulu and others are bringing to the table. Like it's it's really a complex business to navigate this stuff. And like six, these six features that we've made have all been funded through a mix, pure philanthropy, hybrid, TV broadcaster, philanthropy, um, just, you know, what else is there? Oh, you know, like just actually the opposition was, was no broadcaster, uh, just sort of Screen Australia, the old signature fund, which philanthropy. is philanthropy. <laughs> you know, they're all incredibly complicated to put together and take quite a long time. And then the distribution takes just as much time again. Yeah. 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 And just, I mean, just fi the final thing I just wanted to say is like in terms of building audience, it's, I mean, Mads mentioned 12 months. I would be saying like mm -hmm. from day dot, from when you first have an idea, you need to be thinking about your audience and how you're going to find them and also get them excited to go along on this crazy, often really long journey. Um, I mean, everyone, like, everyone loves to use the, everyone loves to take credit for Embrace. Um, you know, that was a transmission. It had a traditional um, um, distributor attached. Um, and I think it did quarter of a million dollars in traditional cinema. Um, and then it did the rest of its box office to tip it over to 1.1 uh, through cinema on demand. Now that just doesn't happen. 
Like it just, you know, it's a good, it's a really good film. But Taryn Brumford had been working on her community and her movement. She created a body image movement um, for three years. So, and she'd managed, and she's such a great communicator on social media that her whole, her fans and her community were just desperate to help her get this film out there. And so that's why it was such a crazy success. And look, sometimes we nail it, sometimes we don't. Um, we found it really hard to, we thought for sure, China Love is gonna be really popular with the Chinese diaspora. And, um, you know, and we tried all sorts of things like, um, you know, making it available, advertising on WeChat and doing a payment gateway on um, a, a demand film for WeChat. And we had a few little viral things happening on WeChat as well, but like, I don't, think we were entirely successful in um, penetrating and getting getting finding and getting them to come to the cinema but I know those guys are the ones doing the Facebook watching the Facebook posts and possibly the shorter content so um, and the other just sorry I'm going on I just I, I actually I, I was really interested before when I asked everyone who had seen backtrack in the cinema and I'm also interested to see if anyone has seen any of our films in the cinema and paid for a ticket. Good on you. Good on you. <laughs> but, but for me, like, I can really see, and we can discuss this later in Q&A, but I, I really think we need to take a real, bit of tough love. Like, we need, I can't see where our documentary loving audience who goes to the cinema and pays for a ticket outside of a festival is. So, and I think often we're all reinventing the wheel. Each cinema, each each release that we do, we're like trying to find a new audience. But where's like our baseline? Where's our audience that we just know that we there'll be five thousand people in Australia who we know will turn up and watch this documentary because it's an Australian documentary. That's my food for thought. I think there's very good questions back. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. Fantastic. And now we turn to the last person on the panel, Anna Bronowski. Um Anna's films I've, I've loved over the years. Uh, <laughs> well, she describes herself as being subversive, political, and bizarre in her oh, bio. Bizarre, not me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the films. <laughs> I'm very straight. <laughs> Sorry, I, I left out the word documents, the thank subversive, you, you. political, and bizarre. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I'm sure many of you would have seen or know certainly Forbidden Lies. Um, the, her recent ones include Aim High and Creation and um, Please Explain, which was on ABC SBS. recently? S SBS recently. I saw it account. Yeah. yeah, and she's working on a new one that she might tell you a little bit about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. I think let's start off by looking at the Please Explain trailer. Yeah, uh, before we play it though, can I just say that, that Hanson Please Explain was my third feature doc. It was commissioned at feature length by SBS, which um, is just almost unheard mm -hmm. of and was I was lucky. Um, but it was made for TV. It, so the other two features I'd made um, I was going on along the mantra that if it's going to work in the cinema, it will work on TV. And those two uh, kind of did. I mean, the second one, Aim High and Creation, was bought by Netflix after it was made. But this one was commissioned by SBS with a lot of balls, actually, because I said, I want to make a film about Pauline Hanson. And they said, but we're the multicultural broadcaster. Are you joking? Mm -hmm. And I said, that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. um, we made it with CJZ. And so the storytelling style and I really want to get into this after we play it because what I'm really interested in in listening to everyone is the difference between documentary and and factual. factual. I want to get into that. So let's play this, but just note, it was narration made for TV. Pauline Hanson came from old, white, rural, racist Australia. Are you xenophobic? We are in danger of being swamped by Asians. Please explain. I used to see it like directing a movie with a really bad cast. I'm a mother, and the Australian people are my children. The more they bashed me, the more public support I got. She shook the political system apart. You won't get rid of me! She's in irrelevance. Well, I'm still here. They haven't got rid of me. last person they want to see on the floor of Parliament is me. 
<laughs> yeah, so sorry about the poor res. I just ripped it off off the internet. But um, the thing about the thing about Hanson, please explain, is that I had a similar experience to you guys with China Love. Um, it was an ecosystem. So sure, it was a feature made for TV, and sure, I had to do the band-aid hand-holding narration, um, and sure, you know, I had to make a, a few artistic sacrifices in order to make it work, and I was pleased with it, and it was a different sort of methodology with cliffhangers and making sure we've got ad breaks every, you know, uh, 20 minutes or whatever it was. Um, but what came with it was this wonderful infrastructure of SBS Online and the very talented uh, factual and doco filmmakers that work there who are artists at, at, at the, um, the craft of the two minute or 60 second clip mm. and it came with SBS's audience and of course it came with controversy because why are we making a film about Hanson? Why are we normalising her? Well, get with the program, she's normalised, she's in the Senate and we need to have this debate without the kind of um, sneering as a class snobbery, I think, is what she was treated with the first time she emerged in 96. Um, anyway, we, we don't have to talk about Hanson, thank God. But um, a clip came out as part of when we were about to release the film. Uh, Hanson and Ashby incidentally tried to stop us releasing the film. 24 hours before it went to air, I got a, a, mm. a phone call from Ashby and that the text is still in my phone saying, if you don't remove that online clip on SBS Online advertising your film, something terrible will happen. And I'm, we're going to play that online clip in a minute because in two days that reached 2.4 million views. Um, it's very short. But what it manages to do is just encapsulate everything we love and hate about Hanson. So as a result of that clip, a day before it went to air on SBS, Hansen's Facebook page, Pauline Hansen's Please Explain, was getting flooded, flooded with nasty uh, comments from her supporters and she was furious. Um, and they were saying, we, you've defamed her by running this clip. So uh, at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night, um, I'm calling SBS, SBS is calling their defamation lawyer and the defamation lawyer is asking for the uncut version of the scene. I have to supply that. And finally, I think it was about 11 o'clock that night, the day before it went to air, the defamation lawyer came, set back, came, came back and said, um, uh, Hanson's right, the clip is defamatory, she's defamed herself. <laughs> so <laughs> leave, it, leave it in. Um, so let's just play that clip because it, to me it was, it was Doco Gold as a filmmaker. Um, it reached more viewers, it, you know, you dream of reaching huge audiences and this one really did. 30 seconds. It's my favourite topic, refugees. You're not going to tell me you're a refugee, James, are you? No, Aboriginal. <laughs> really? Yeah. I wouldn't have picked it. It's good to see that you're actually, you know, taking up this and working. <laughs> so you can see why Hanson didn't feel that was good for her brand. Um, but I want to go back to, because I've, I've, I'm, I'm making my fourth feature documentary now, and I found it harder and harder each time, as we all have. And I want to talk about what this panel's about, which is the rise of the feature doc. In fact, I'd say that the feature doc has been on the rise since Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11 best film, not best documentary, but best film at Cannes, when suddenly we were in an age of spin and audiences became hungry for another version of capturing the truth, which was not the media or politicians, which they weren't trusting anymore, but documentary. And I think that this is why feature doc keeps booming as it, and is in fact exploding in film festivals all over the world and is a genre in its own right, and rightly so on the SVOD beer moths, um, people are still hungry for a more authentic or sincere rendering of the truth, however that's done, whether it's dramatised truth like casting Jean Benet or whether it's observational truth like Scotty's um, Backtrack Boys. Both of those films have tremendous heart and integrity and are winning audiences. So I, I'm going to keep it really quick because I know I'm the tail end and people have left, but <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, first of all, let's talk about the culture of documentary. So I remember in 2004, 
I was making a film about my aunt called Helen's War. Um, I was making it for a company that has now become one of the large ones in the Darwinian infrastructure that the, um, the Screen Australia set up in its wisdom 10 years ago, which has effectively seen original independent filmmakers left in the cold and struggling to survive and taking jobs, other jobs, in order to keep doing what they love. And I remember making this film and there was a problem in the edit and of course, you know, as a director writer, I was fighting for my vision. And I can remember the um, executive producer of that company saying, oh, that's right, you make art. And I can remember thinking, this is what we're really talking about. We're talking about an industrial model, a neo-capitalist model that talks about product and churning it around and churning it around quickly. And we're talking about documentary, which has always been about the art of storytelling. And I think it's kind of a no-brainer that we need to sort of challenge this institutionalized distrust of the creative that has crept into the discourse to the point where we're no longer even talking uh, in policy circles, the, the public broadcasters, the funding bodies, I know some are, about films being made in the national interest, not for money, not to fill time slots, but to talk to us about who we are in all our diverse, miraculous, kind of complex ways. We're not telling these stories anymore, and, and we need to, or rather we are, but somehow it's all flipped. And, and the people at the coalface who keep doing it because they love doing it and are reaching audiences, look at Backtrack, look at Embrace, Look at China Love, your film. We are reaching audiences. Audiences are hungry for this. And yet the model is saying, no, you're not legitimate because you're not a large company. You're not, you know, you're not run by a, an EP from England. So somehow <laughs> you just don't, you're just not valid. Um, so I want to move on to funding. It's not enough that filmmakers now, and I really feel for you guys, the younger ones who are coming through now, it's not right that you should only have to go to DAF or that you should be working in an American model where you have to beg philanthropists to fund your film. You have to look for an angel. Our funding bodies were set up by Gough Whitlam et al and the public broadcasters to back films made in the national interest, stories by Australians for Australians, whatever that means. And obviously it's more and more exciting and dynamic now than when Gough set it up. So the funding needs to reflect that. And you guys need to, we need to all join the fight for that. Um, Mitzi called it the debate. We need to be part of the debate. Um, I think it's very important that we also argue to the neoliberals who are making these decisions, or some of them, that featured documentary has a good economic proven model. It is finding huge audiences overseas. It is holding its own against drama films and in fact often beating them at box office in Australia. And therefore I think what we should be saying to our funding bodies, and the broadcasters is another issue, um, is that the money for features should be genre agnostic. So anyone who acts, wants to access money for a feature film, whether it's a doc, an animation, or a drama, needs to go in there and prove they have an audience. Not, let's give all the money to drama, and there's doco over there on the grey carpet, those, you know, the poor cousins, they can go to the philanthropists. We need to be kind of getting with the program about feature docs are exploding. Big, glossy, bold, crazy films made with art are doing really well and there are Australian films in those those boxes that are, are blitzing overseas and I'm sure everyone like your next one's going to do that too. Mine, mine blitzed in Gympie, Queensland <laughs> and um, I had a great moment that I loved where um, this um, old farmer came up and said that's the best film I've, that's the best documentary I've ever seen. And then his wife said, well, Harold, that's the only documentary <laughs> I've seen. I love it. I love it. <laughs> that um, would be one of my highlights. I think, uh, I think, I think, <laughs> it's gorgeous. I mean your next one, not that one. The one about uh, sex work, that's going to, yeah. Well, anyway, I, no, I haven't finished. Shut up. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, what was I going to say? Okay, so the ecosystem, yes. 
the, the DOOC or the documentary book, wonderful model to build your audience. I've done that twice now and I've had to, partly out of necessity, but what I've found is when I wrote a book about my North Korean film and um, I wrote about filming in North Korea and hanging out with the filmmakers, suddenly I was able to cross fertilise. So people reading the book wanted to watch the film, people watching the film wanted to read the book and vice versa. I did it with Hanson too and uh, partly to generate um, more debate, but I'm, I'm, I just want to be very quick. The final thing is censorship. Mm. Let's talk about this. So, Nick, that's so wrong that you get funding from a state industry, government uh, organisation, and then you're required to remove a scene because it doesn't fit with the propaganda of that state or that government. It's happening across the board. It's happening in academic funding where the minister now has discretion to just yeah. write off, you know, with a stroke of a pen, $400,000 going to peer-reviewed research projects. And I had a similar problem, and I'm, I'm kind of fearless right now because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm employed, so I'm not too terrified, although maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but <coughs> I experienced censorship at our national broadcaster, and our national broadcaster is a precious resource. We are so lucky to have it. And it is exactly where we should be seeing our documentaries, exactly on the ABC. People, I think it's 70% or more of Australians trust the ABC for their news more so than any other source. People love it. It is our ABC. And this is where our docos belong. This is where the accords belong. We need a... Sorry? 80%. Thank you. Because Ita told us. Okay. Ita told us, and hopefully under Ita it will go to 92. <laughs> um, but we also need a dedicated feature slot. You know, we need, we, the BBC has it. Why are we struggling to get the BBC in their wisdom maybe to, we need to, bring to some take British us? People in and tell us oh, that. well, yeah, maybe. I mean, <laughs> how, I, don't think, I don't think we have much more room for, for we've, we've got a lot of British people here already telling us what to do, but, which is another issue. But anyway, Screen Australia, uh, sorry, ABC. Okay, so once again, very lucky, 2012, I think it was. Alan Urson, good on him, who was then the head of factual, factual at the ABC, said, yeah, we'll take your North Korea doc. And I said, oh, I'll make it as a one hour. I'll, no, 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 we'll take it as a feature. I said, oh, thank you very much. I was amazed and good on him. Made the film. It was exactly what I'd pitched the ABC, which was a film about a bunch of uh, Australian actors and in fact their Juche instructor who's sitting right up there. By the way, he's the best doco actor in the country, Grisha and he deserves being employed. So if you're looking for actors in DOCO, he's, he's your man. Make a North Korean propaganda film to stop a coal seam gas mine in Sydney Park. What it's really about is propaganda. So I go to North Korea and back, anyway, whatever. Um, but the point is, in it, there's a lot of criticism of coal seam gas. There's a lot of criticism of origin en energy. There are interviews with farmers up in Chinchilla in tears because what CSG is doing to their land there are, fil there are shots of North Korean filmmakers watching these farmers in Chinchilla and say, saying, how could your leaders do this to your people? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a real reversal. It's about how we're all manipulated. The ABC looked at that at Rough Cut and said, what have you done? What have you given us? And they put me through this labyrinthine fact-checking thing that went on for about, I think, two months. It was like having a tax audit. I had to keep going in and justifying various decisions I'd made. Did I make that phone call? You know, it was all of that, and in the end, the, the, the thing was pulled from the 8 o'clock time slot and put on ABC Arts, who, good on them, were happy to take it. After, you know, then went on to sell to Netflix and played all over the world for two years. But it's censorship. I mean, that, that you know, oh, we're terrified that the mining industry will will somehow react negatively to this thing that we've commissioned or that will be called out about it. And that's sad. I mean, I really feel for the people who are at the ABC who are dealing with this and losing their funding, and that's the, that's the awful thing. But what a, what a situation we're in if the government is having that kind of influence over what we as storytellers, with integrity, are trying to do. That's fantastic. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> Great. I just want a second, maybe just make a couple of very small comments. Um, when you say, yes, our docs should be shown on the ABC, 
you know, you'd be surprised how many fine docs are made and actually funded through Film Australia, I mean, sorry, Screen Australia, that n are never shown on the ABC or SBS mm. or in ITV, but yet have a festival life here and overseas. Mm. Um, and a lot of those docs tend to be more the personal essay documentaries, which actually you, you make in many ways. That that's, that's your speciality. But I think that's something that's, uh, that I addressed a bit in the paper that's sort of worth um, commenting it's quite on. It's extraordinary because you look on the... Um TV and um, this, they've got all these. I remember when Mark Scott was buying all these digital channels, and I'm, I remember thinking, God, you know, this is obsession about getting all these digital t channels. And I mm. thought, what is this? You know, you've got to have. What are you going to put on all these mm. channels? It's like building schools and forgetting about. Oh, that's right, we have to pay the school teachers. Mm. You know, the schools don't, aren't anything without the people in them who are going to be working there. And I feel mm. like you've got all these people who've actually made films, and they've got all these channels, and they're buying up all this cheap stuff from overseas to fill them up, to literally fill slots. And I'm like, why, why is that even happening? I, I think, look, I think the only other thing I, I just... It reminded me of what I wanted to say, um, which is that we're also failing to maintain and nurture our audience. So if audiences are flocking to our films at film festivals, and they are all over the world, and if they're flocking to them at Cinema On Demand, and SBS and ABC are saying, oh, well, you know, we're commissioning rehashed foreign formats because they get audiences. Who's right? Like, why, why aren't we seeing the writing on the wall and saying, you know, audiences want this stuff. These broadcasters are the platforms for it. Yes, we want to dedicate the slot for Australian documentaries, which actually existed yeah. a decade ago. Yeah, exactly. Mm. We need to bring that back. And mm. I, I, I think that um, that's what... There's a wonderful group of doco makers, I think it was 330 signatures and counting at the last count, where we are trying to do just that. Because I, I really do think, um, final thing is that if you, it's a Nugget Coombs quote brought to us by Mark Doyle just a few hours ago, um, build culture and industry will follow, build industry and the culture disappears. Mm. And we're in an industry model right now and really, you know, I, <laughs> God, if I look at the ABC right now, I think I'm in suburban England. So I, I'm just, we've got to bring it back. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I just wanted to say, shortly before I came out, a friend of mine in the US had posted um, on Facebook an article just written by Michael Moore for IndieWire. And I have to say, it's called 13 Rules for Making Documentary Films. Um, and as somebody said earlier, really, Fahrenheit 9-11 was, uh, was one of the things that kind of um, broke the ground for theatrical release of documentary in the last few years. Um, I only had time to read point one before I ran out because I didn't want to be late, but I just thought it was worth mentioning in context of this conversation. I mean, A, read the whole thing, but B, he says here... What is the first rule of Fight Club? The first rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. The first rule of documentaries is don't make a documentary, make a movie. Mm. Stop making documentaries, start making movies. You've chosen this art form, which somebody else said, the cinema, this incredible, wonderful art form to tell your story. You didn't have to do that. Call yourself a movie. Yeah. And I just thought that was worth totally sharing. Fine. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. In fact, um, just on that point, um, when I was doing um, Backtrack Boys, I actually um, structured it like a drama. I tried to make it feel like a drama and um, it has a three-act structure and I'm actually doing a masterclass next week on it up in um, Byron Bay, actually, just breaking it all apart. Um, so it uses the same sort of things as a, as a traditional movie. But I think it's it also, there's a lot of stuff around with Documentary Australia where, you know, they're doing impact campaign films. And I think the best campaign film is one that doesn't actually feel like a campaign film. I think yeah. if you feel like it's a campaign, you've failed. Um, you've got to tell a cracking good story and motivate people to want to take action from it um, in whatever way that might be. I, I, I like what you were saying to um, Gregory that documentary has a, a brand problem. It's, exactly. still, it's still a little bit like broccoli. You eat it because it's good for you and that's a real problem. Yeah. Um, but we are making movies and all movies have to tell a story and that's why I think we should revisit this idea that funding for feature films needs to be genre agnostic. Does it work? 
I mean, when, when we made Forbidden Lies, we never called it a documentary. We called it a real life thriller or catch me, catch me if you can with chicks. And you know, that's that you, you've got to entertain the audience. Don't be boring, especially if you've got a message. If you've got a message, you know, no one's going to listen unless you make them laugh and make them cry and give them beauty. So yeah, it's really hard actually. <laughs> I want to take it back to the funding aspect. People here have talked about, well, the Western Australian Film Organisation, the ABC and censorship. Like, I personally have watched more documentaries on Netflix than I ever have because my trust in the ABC over the last five to six, seven years has really gone down because of the stuff they are commissioning, etc. And I think you will actually find a lot more younger people are actually watching documentaries because on Netflix and places like that because they are uh, showing the audience what they want to see. Mm. And so sh our broadcasters are just really digging their own hole. They're losing this younger audience who... Not the sh is the Australian industry actually putting something together almost to fund or even speaking to Netflix about putting a fund together that is focused on that? If, if yes, there is. So there's like a cross... Part, cross um, several organisations, the Australian Directors Guild, the Screen Producers Association, the, the MEAA, this the new guilds. kind of informal group, the guilds. guilds. They're all, and there's like quite a worked proposal that's that's been hammered out over the last year, which is asking for the 15% quota on revenue for streaming platforms in Australia. What we need is political support for it. And so, like given that is a few weeks away from the New South Wales election and probably about six weeks away from our federal election, to be honest, what I think would be the most useful thing to do in the next two months would be to go and contact your local members and say to the local, to the state ones, what are you doing about reinstating funding to create New South Wales, which is our state-based um, arts funding organisation, which has been absolutely gutted of funding. and what like my vote for your money first new south wales arts like just be very blunt about it and then the same for the federal things too and we as as individual citizens can do that in the way that organizations like our funding bodies can't i mean they're government employees so if you i think to me in the very short term i would be doing that the long term is going to take a bit longer and the um the the the, the really easy way to do it is to go to the make australia make it Make it Australian, Make it Australian campaign, campaign but also and sign up, and you can do the automatic, you know, emails to your politicians. Yeah, but do it but now. It's clear that the counts. federal and state governments are politicising the granting of this funding. Yeah, but look, Netflix is not the good guy here. Netflix has resisted this again and again and again. If they can get away with not having a quota and not having to commission Australian content here, they will. I understand that quotas, no, no commercial business ever <coughs> has quotas, but if you put the business proposition that you're getting this viewership, and actually Netflix has got a lot of the data to show that you are, fight on that, because then you will get the funding. We'll do both. Yeah. We'll do both. Yeah. But, I mean, the thing mm. is... Netflix isn't going to do it with they unless it they're, they're forced. forced. They won't do it without legislation. It has to come from our politicians. And also, I mean, realistically, you know, um, the, the pie has got smaller and the ask on it is getting bigger every year. Like, we can cut the pie differently, but we actually just need more money in the system. And it's really unfair that our free-to-air and our cable um, providers are working with the quotas, whether and the newer models, SVODs, are coming in without those quotas and that's where the audience is going. Like, you're completely right. Under 35 has abandoned linear TV and they don't buy cable either. So, yeah, the broadcasters are aware of that. They're very worried about it. Um, in the immediate solution, like quotas, yeah. Um, audience, um, in my first week of classes at afters and tonight, I'm hearing that audience is the key. Mm. Uh, am should I be building up my own, with, with the global obsession with social media, should I be, as a future producer, be building up my own individual, personalised social media audience? And if I don't do that, am I going to be behind the game in three years' time when I graduate? Can I just say something to that? Each film, you'll be tapping into a different social media audience. So it's not like, unless you're, I mean, Michael Moore might have a social media following because he's actually a character in his own films. And also just like to say actually, it didn't start with uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, it started with Roger and Me actually. I remember, I lived in New York at that time and Roger and Me and Hoop Dreams were the two films that came out and really did really well at the cinemas. And I remember 
thinking, oh my God, this is a whole new ball game because before that it was like POV and um, you know the uh, independent lens and all these other sort of shows that they had. And I remember those two films and he, he through Roger and Me, which is about him going back to his own hometown in Flint, Michigan, um, that really was created the brand. That was his branding of himself. And so people like that or, or Thoreau, you know, who, who was also in his films, those people can create um, social media followings. But you will find if you're actually, your films are actually about other subjects and you've got other characters, each film will have its own social media following. Every now and then they might follow you and jump ship and go to your next film from a past film because people will know your name. But really you will have to each time kind of build it up now if there's a way that we can share resources um because there are certain films that reach certain audiences that would be something where as filmmakers like we could work cooperatively on that you know but you've got to be careful not to bombard people and you know this whole idea of a baseline i don't think there is a baseline audience i know but i i really i'm going to be in my bonnet about this because like i think like i see all of the hard work that we all do and we do we all reinvent the wheel for each film and yes every film does have a niche audience and you and you want to kind of access that and you spend a lot of time uh, you know, accessing those niche audiences that you know, you know, you, you wouldn't normally access. And I, I look to, you know, we're starting to travel a bit more to different conferences and I look to the, you know, the best kind of documentary community in the world, I would say, is in Toronto. Um, they, have a, they have a cinema there, they have a, cult, a, a documentary culture there where they have weekly screenings. They have, um, you know, they, they actually had... Um, China Love, they flew out, they had a, you know, one of their monthly screenings was featured, um, you know, featuring China Love and they flew out Olivia and, you know, she did a Q&A there. And I, I, I often just sort of look at all of this hard work that we're doing. I, I actually think we all need to be more collaborative. I think and, and I think that, you know, it's all very well. And I, I think, I, I think, yes, we're, we're creating some really wonderful films. I think if we want to, con- if we want to continue making films for the cinema, and I, I would love to because I mm. think there are certain films that just need to be seen in a cinema in a dark room, and have a discussion afterwards. But if we're going to continue doing it, like we all in this room, like uh, there were five people who put up their hand when I said, "How many of you have seen, a paid for a ticket to go and see a documentary in the cinema?" And to me, like, and this is our base. This is our. These are our people. You know, like I really feel strongly about this. And so I've just in my own, in my spare time, of which I have very little, like five minutes a week, I've started this Facebook page called Doc Lovers Club. And it's not about the industry. It's not about the funding. It's not about the quotas. You know, I try to do a post once a week. I've done it for Backtrack. I've done it for um, Your Film Net. And it's to just to kind of say, look, there are some screenings happening. Come along, you know, and like there's 300 people in it. But wouldn't it be great? And you all can go on there and help run it. I've been doing the same. I've been cross-promoting Undermine because (laughs) we have the same distributor but also thought that there would be some some, some crossover in our audiences. So I've been sort of cross-promoting with that. But I think we could be a little bit more organised on that front. Um, I mean, even like I, we, when we were choosing uh, with Umbrella, we were choosing whether we went with on-demand films or will we go with Fanforce. One of the things I was looking for, which is the cinema on-demand models, it was like I was looking at what films they actually had and what, so I could tap into their audience. So they had Zack Ceremony and they had some of these other youth films. And I thought, you know, maybe I would go with Fanforce. And it wasn't just my decision. It was It was also Umbrella's decision because I felt like, they had audiences that had already come out for a lot of the, the body of work that they had in their kind of sort of um, in their catalogue, you know. So you also and and I just want to go back to the cinemas because oh Jesus Christ, do I have some stories to tell there? Um, you know, they deregulated the cinema system quite a long time ago, and I, I tell you what. So we had this great thing where it sounds really fantastic. So you you your distributor goes, okay, we're going to do this alternate content. Sounds great. You think, okay, I'm realistic. You know, there's not you know, humongous amounts of people out there. You know, we can't compete with, you know, Thor and all those sort of films. So they go, OK, you get two weekends and you get something during the week. That's three three screenings a week. And you think that's realistic because I know I'm going to have to do a lot of work to fill up those cinemas, right? So you're going, OK, that's great. It sounds really good. 
Um, but then you go to these cinemas and it's like um, Hoyts or events and uh, that we were working with. And, um, you know, so the first week goes pretty good. We did pretty well that first week. Uh, but because we were being compared with A Star Is Born, which came out the same week, all right, um, and the following week um, Bohemian Rhapsody came out, like seriously, like... That's what we're up against. So, you know, they're comparing the whole week. So you've got your three days that's comp competing on their spreadsheets with eight screenings a day, seven days a week, right? So, of course, you're going to like, you do re your screenings do really well, but when it's being compared to, to all those, so then they make decisions based on that. So then the next week they go, oh, we're putting you at nine o'clock in the morning. And you're going, oh, great. Like, even mother's groups don't sort of convene at that time. You know what I mean? And so we're going, oh, like, how can we even reach the fucking mother's groups? Because they don't even tell us till Thursday. And it's all starting on Saturday because they kind of don't even tell you. And it's really, like, it's the most infuriating thing. If I w we even had, we went the Dendi, and we were, we were put at 10.40 on a Sunday. And I was thinking, oh, well, it's not great. But I guess people will kind of be awake and they might kind of go from the coffee shop to the cinema and then on the Friday seriously then they go oh it's no it's going to be at 9 30 9 30 right and I'm going oh shit no one's going to come it's going to be shit I don't even have time to, to like I'm so busy I don't even have time to email all my friends that actually live in Newtown to tell them I just thought oh my god I can just see they're going to rock up it's going to you know sold out sold out and standing ovations at 9 30 in the fucking morning can I just tell you yeah, but I'm just saying this is what you're up against and it's infuriating and so my big takeaway is you know what I don't know if I want to do this sort of big cinema thing I think I need to figure out another way like start small and this is what I said to to Nick I said Nick I don't know if you want it because I had this whole thing I was on you know oh, I want 100 cinemas blah blah you know put my vision out there and I just think that was kind of stupid, really. And I think it would, it would have been much, much better to start with your boutique um, cinemas, you know, your palaces, your dendies and stuff. But you have to really plan ahead. Um, you can't just book at the last minute like you can with the Netflix and the Hoyts. You have to really plan ahead. And so, you know, we were in a position with our distributor where there's a lot of change happening in the organisation, so that wasn't possible. And then I think start that or do do something with Hoyts and events but mix it up and have some um, some COD screenings where you get to choose your time and they can't change it at the last minute and you've got your dedicated screenings. Just make sure they're not in a competing district to where your other ones is and create... I think we have to get really strategic about actually how we roll out and I've got some ideas about how to do that and I was sharing them with my distributor, which is a really interesting situation where I'm giving them ideas about from my experience. But I'd like rock up, seriously. And the, the, the poster, like, you know, because the 12 year old that was running the cinema was also doing the popcorn and they'd turn the cinema on. And you go up and say, where's my poster? You've got, you know, A Star Is Born and all these other ones, you know, and where's Backtrack Boys? And they're like, oh, I don't know. What does it look like? And I said, oh, it's like this. And I showed them the fly, except it's big. <laughs> I said, can you go out and look in the in the back and tr see if you can find it? And they're like, okay. And they're like out there trying to... F and it's been sent to them. Like our distributors sent it to them and sent them an email and followed it. And they don't even put... It's like selling coffee in a shop and not putting it on the menu. You know? And I'm like, uh, seriously. So I am I am so gutted. You know, like... Everyone, and my friend Elaine goes, Kathy, shut up. Everyone thinks this is really successful. Don't tell them the horror stories. But I think we have to hear these stories because we've, we've sort of got this illusion that somehow this cinema experience is going to be this... It's such a battle. It's such a fight. And you have to... We, Lisa and a whole team of us spent days and days and days doing social media, sending out emails, calling up organisations, getting them to do... It. It's, it's like... I mean, I feel like I should just run for government instead. It's seriously yeah. that much work. I should just run, and I think I might, because I don't think I can afford to be a documentary filmmaker anymore. <laughs> uh, my, my question is still on the audience, and I think, Anna, you said that, uh, you know, um, by the Australians, for the Australians. Yep. But we've got to sort of admit that, that uh, you know, we are all looking for global audiences, yep. and uh, that's where... Uh, the eyeballs are really yes. and my question is for the China love how important was your uh, how, when, when you define the audience 
uh, the Chinese audience, and you mentioned about diaspora, because that's kind of like in reverse. Um, did, that, did you put that in your equation when you started your project? In terms of screening to China? And the, the audience. Or, or the audience, yeah. I mean, look, we, we, we really did. Part of our strategy around audience was to, you know, we did research around, uh, in Australia, we did research around, you know, payment gateways, everyone's on WeChat. We'd obviously been filming in China. They have a whole different way of currency. No one uses money, no one uses credit cards. It's all on WeChat. That's how they find out about things. So we, um, with, with Demand Film, we set up a, a WeChat um, payment gateway because we thought that's where they'll be wanting to spend their money in Australia uh, in terms of buying a ticket. Um, and, and, and yeah, and then we also had um, a wonderful woman, Hazel Xing, who uh, is Chinese and living here and she helped us with the marketing and, uh, you know, to try and tap into that audience. So that was like a really, we also reached out to, you know, easy weddings and wedding blogs and the Australian all, International Photography Association. Yeah, we were trying all to do that some stuff. Yeah. Things. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. My um, my oh, sorry. half my family's Chinese, so I just made them <laughs> made bulk them email. <laughs> Several of them came twice. Yeah. Was that China in your equation? Because yes. that's something you're starting a project. Yes. And you want audience to see it. Yeah. But then you. You yeah, know, that was the plan. And yeah. I, I'm not sure we were, yeah, we were like, we'd done like a marketing plan because yeah. you have to, you, have you know, you have it. to have a vision of pathway to audience. You don't, they don't give you the money unless no. you've really thought about that. Yeah. And then in terms of China, like that's a whole different ball game where we're now, we're pitching it. It's screened over in China and it's been uh, it allowed to screen. Censorship. Got through censorship. I'm not sure if we get through yeah. censorship, but it, they, they passed it. So now if you're... Well, it can actually be shown in China. So now there's an opportunity to do it. Whereas before... Yeah we got through the censorship it was not very clear whether it would because there are some references to the cultural revolution in, in the film that may or may not upset people but so they're more interested sorry they're sorry. more that china doesn't have a documentary going culture mm. they have everybody is watching stuff online and seriously we should all be seeing watching what's going on there and you know they they get like they, they'll kind of laugh at a two million you know, viral Facebook yeah. things. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> how yeah. cute! You know, like you know, like twenty million is viral for them. So, so we're now pitching China Love as a series, short form, ten to fifteen minutes, um, and working with a Chinese partner over there. So, Yuku, Billy, Billy, um, those those sorts of platforms. I, I think if you're going to try and finance a feature doc, and it's an ambitious one with dramatized elements, needing performers, and perhaps you're going to travel in it which is what my ones are, you absolutely have to factor in the international audience. So I'm always looking for stories that will travel internationally. They may be Australian, but they have some kind of element that is going to appeal across the board. So with Aim High in Creation, I already knew that Kim Jong-il was a, a pop culture icon, you know, um, thanks to Team America. And there was millions of people out there for that, but also there was a growing interest in North Korea um, and that film became a kind of... And I also feel that if the Australian government agencies are going to fund you, you need to deliver. Like, you need to make something that will help advance Australia in a certain way, uh, cultural diplomacy, if you like. And what I've liked about that film is it's ended up, you know, it was playing in Yale University the night Trump got elected, and it just had a multiplex cinema release in South Korea last year. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the Sony hacking scandal, it sold to Netflix. So, you know, if you're going to... I believe that the, the, the kind of budget levels we're talking about for Australian-made international features above and beyond sort of earn their stripes back for our country and what we're trying to do in, in terms of the, the rest of the world and, and putting ourselves out there. Rebecca and Cathy, you mentioned you've had to reinvent the wheel a couple of times with uh, distributing your films. Would it be worthwhile uh, documenting the uh, cinema on demand and release strategy and processes so that other filmmakers could uh, access that as a resource? I'd be happy to share my knowledge. I'm just trying to finish um, a film right now and pay rent. I just spend so much time trying to scramble around to survive that. I haven't had time to do that, but I am actually going to be talking about it at a couple of Screenworks things, and I'm doing impact sort of um, seminars at different universities. So I've, I'm actually got the material, and 
once I have a break, um, which I haven't had for a very long time, I would love to sort of write it down and, and actually brainstorm with some other people and make that available. I wish, actually, uh, that I had that access to that information. Like, about 18 months ago, it would have made a huge difference to me. And I think um, I would have made some different decisions, actually. So I am um, in the spirit of wanting documentary, and not just documentary, but just really good films that are made by Australians who are by passionate artists. I'm really um, happy to share what I've experienced and, and hear from others. Thank you. Yeah. Mark. Hi, I, I, I have... Um, I don't have a question, I'd just like to make a couple of statements. This evening there was a, a figure mentioned about um, Sundance and $20 million. One of those films was $10 million, okay? So, that, so the, of the $20 million, one film, $10 million. That was the one about the, the new American senator, uh, whatever her name is, Ortez. Okay, so that's that doesn't mean mean docu feature documentary is booming. The other thing I have to say: in the last three days, I've been having conversations with Netflix. They're scaling back. Okay, they are scaling back. What they the policy, the new policy, and a, a colleague of my daughter is the, works for Netflix, so this has been a a one to one Skype call. I wouldn't be investing a lot of hope in Netflix at all. They are doing. They are going to commission fewer films with bigger budgets, and all they're interested in is the big Attenborough kind of um, natural history. They will buy as cheaply as possible from people like us lesser films. So, the, what I my conversation with my young colleague at Netflix is, documentaries are not working for Netflix. Okay. Well, Martin. that's not that's not the intelligence from my conversation three days ago. Well, Wild, the Wild West, like yes, yes, yes. But the Netflix the originals are not going to be commissioning that sort of thing anymore. They're going oh, okay. for uh, so what they believe that Middle America will buy, mm -hmm. and that will be bland wildlife. So they're moving away from niche subjects. Correct. Yeah, but look, I, I just think. Yeah, look, I, I just think look, it changes It changes every six months. Yeah. Like, you've really just got to adapt and swivel, whatever, you know. It will. And, and actually... Keep, so I, say, I say at the office, keep moving like a shark, because if you stop moving, you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> just if people want to, there's a really, really good resource that everybody has to um, look at, which is documentarytelevision.com. It's, uh, it's written by a guy called Peter Hamilton. He's this documentary wonk. He's honestly, he doesn't make films. He just watches us make them. And then he writes this incredible blog. And he wrote this article about the success at Sundance this year, $20 million in sales, 10 million to one film, the rest to add another 10 films, not a huge. But then last year was a disaster at Sundance. Nobody bought anything, right? But the year before that was a bumper crop, like huge sales there. Like it's very cyclical. Yeah, Netflix are off something this year and, and they're into point. natural history this year. They'll be back again yeah. some other year. It's true though, like it is across the board. Actually, before I came, I made a list of who's doing, who's funding feature films. Maybe I'll stick it, give it to Tom, he can stick it on the list. But it's true, I think the overall trend is to, towards A-list talent in, in participant or in team. So if you, I think in actually Peter's blog, he says something like, Either if it's an unknown subject, it better be made by Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. And if it's by an unknown person, it needs to be about Steven Spielberg. So that is true. Like the <laughs> subject matter is <laughs> narrowing down that way. Yeah. And that there will always be tiers of filmmaking going on and there will and the squeezes on the bottom levels. But um, well, I mean, look, I think it's always been difficult, you know. Yeah, and yeah. I think you know, I mean you can just look at the catalogues of like Mad Men and Dog Wolf, you know, like in the early days of their they used to do like lots of different kinds of mm. art and and also social issue dockers. Now they you, you find it's all very celebrity, like they're all celebrity artists um, or musicians, you know, and you and you, it's, you, I'm seeing like they're building up a catalogue, they're specialising in a boutique sort of thing, like makes sense for them. But you can see those trends and how they operate because those subjects come with audiences. So it's really easy for a distributor if you pick up a film and it's got an inbuilt audience. Like if you do something about you know, um, what's his name? The uh, working class um, Jimmy, Barnes. Jimmy Barnes and the working class yeah. hero or boy or whatever it was called. Um, you know, that just came because there was a book, there was a stage production 
And then there was him who's been around in all of our lives. For, so you have these inbuilt audiences. So when you do a documentary like that, you know, it's, a, it's really safe. So I think what you're addressing is the, is the issues of, you know, taking the risk, taking the creative risks and the gamble and all that sort of stuff. And yes, I never, I don't hold out much hope for Netflix, and which is why we want to, as what Anna was saying and, and Tom is that we have to sort of push for quotas. Now, if, if Canada, you know, Canada are the nicest people in the world and somehow they managed to get Netflix to do it. So I don't understand why we can't. Yes. Well, we so. can, we're just not. Yeah, we're but we've got to, to just, we're going to. So, like, so that should take care of that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, there's a question <laughs> back, Jill. Um, I just wanted, to, I was just interested in sort of getting a bit of a scale from all of you in terms of what the sort of budgets are that you're looking at for feature documentaries these days. Um, That's how long's a piece of string. Like, yeah. you can make them at any level, it just <coughs> depends on kind of what costs I'll you can cut. But Backtrack Boys was made for 500000 um, Our film costs six fifty, and I think we got it up to seven with the Melbourne uh, fund at the end to finish. Opposition. China Love, China Love was seven fifty, but the opposition was three hundred and twenty-five, and the China Call Love. Me Dad was five hundred. Just under was three twenty-five. Yeah, yeah, my last film was six fifty. The Gore Vidal United States of Amnesia, US. Yeah, so that's for something that's delivering to television and cinema broadcasts. Technical so we did a theatrical. Yeah. We mm. didn't. It wasn't television. We did mm. Netflix. Hanson was about six fifty, I think, from memory. But my first one, Forbidden Lies, when we convinced Screen Australia to fund it as if it was a fiction independent feature, was one point five million. Yeah, and they've just gone down ever since. And and also when Anna's film came out, Forbidden Lies, it did better than every like. Um, drama, but the audience at the time. was different. So yeah. listening to Kathy and watching what Kathy's gone through, yeah. if Kathy's film had come out at the same time as Forbidden Lies, she would have had no problem getting audiences. It was a different culture. So back then, we didn't have to beg, borrow, and steal audiences. There was an already a movie-going culture, a dedicated audience for Australian-made films, and if it generated discussion and debate, and people were into it. They'd go. There wasn't this. Uh, we seem to have become going? buried in this cultural Where's cringe again. There's a mass distrust or, or, or disinterest in or even disdain for Australian made movies. And I couldn't believe it. The week Scotty's film came out, um, Book Week also came out, which is, in a sense, it's, it's the drama equivalent of your film. It's brilliantly made, it's got a lovely heart, it really talks to zeitgeist issues, it's a crowd pleaser, audiences love it. And those two films came out in the same week. And I tell you what, from what I know of how cinemas work, if they'd come out 10 years ago, they would have blitzed. So what's happened to our audience? And I guess it's the fracturing of platforms, but there's also a neoliberal kind of thing going on, I think, generally in our culture, where we're just distrusting the creative. It's the de of society. It's the delegitimization of the storytellers in favor of the curators. It's and I think that's happened across the board. And I think that's why we've lost, you know, we've lost a kind of it's also love the ticket of our prices, storytellers. Anna. It's also the ticket prices. Well, they I mean, were it's, it costs a fortune. Back then too. And I think the other thing is, where, final thing, we're talking about audience. Yes, we were deregulated. So did you know that we can't in this country, Kingston, if you're still here, correct me if I'm wrong, we actually can't do what South Korea did. South Korea told their cinemas 20 years ago now, you will play for 200 days of the year South Korean films in your multiplexes and then you can play foreign content. And as a result, Hollywood is booming and it's got one of the most faithful audiences for homegrown f movies anywhere in the world. We can't do that because of the free trade agreement. The only thing we can do is tax, put a tax on tickets for, for foreign films kind of like McDonald's, you know, tax soft drinks so that they come to the stuff that's good for you, which is Australian-made product, and build the audiences again. Uh, beyond that, I don't know what's happened to our audience. I just know that it's much, much, much worse mm. than th that for you th than it was. And I'd like to make a comment. Yeah. This is a comment about all cinema and theatre. Mm. Cinemas and theatres are not in the entertainment business, okay? They're in the real estate business. Mm. It's about how many times you can sell a square, two square feet of real estate 
per day. Mm. And this is true worldwide in live theatre, it's true in cinemas, it is not the entertainment business, it's the real estate business. Which is why it's really, it's, it's, no, that's the, that's the point. And, it's why it's really um, a nasty environment when you take your film out there and try and get it on the screen because, you know, and the distributors, they're all struggling and, you know, you're the, the, the independent, uh, the, um, the feature doc, if it's a feature and it's out there trying to be in the big game, um, you're like every other feature and there's a lot of Australian feature films that fail, most in fact fail yeah. at the box office. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you shouldn't feel bad if your film doesn't make a whole lot of money. Um, you know, we're happy to have an audience and that's kind of a different thing. And so, you know, the question I guess I'm throwing to you is what, what, how, how do you see playing this game of distribution um, is one part of it, um, but the other part of it is uh, the idea of, this, of impact releasing. I see them as two different things. and uh, and. But it seems as if they've been mixed here. You're, you're sort of talking about them as if they're the same thing. Um. Oh, well, I mean, they're related, but different thing. I mean, I agree they're related, but different things. And I guess one of the discussions around impact is that um, screenings don't mean you've made an impact. You just mean you've screened a film, right? So that's one differentiation to make. Um, when you're trying to access niche audiences, often it's with a goal of raising awareness about something. So that's why they cross over in those spaces but yeah you're right like they're different it's sort of a long answer which might be better to talk about <laughs> afterwards yeah uh, well i mean look i i did a uh, the last film i did and, um, which was a great film gregory's film was really good it was a it was brilliant it was about tell me the name again it was about the guy that was <laughs> shot no no i remember that i've seen the film twice i loved it so it was called Cultivating Murder. But Thank I you. Had, I had the best time of my life doing it. It was I had so much fun. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It was incredibly hard work. Um, but um, I met an audience for the first time ever. Mm. And every other time uh, something had gone to air and it's a television and uh, you, you, you don't know what happened out there. You know, you hear things and whatever. But So it was the best thing I'd ever done. I don't know, if I, I, I don't know how I'd go about doing it again. But it's a very different thing to releasing a film uh, into, a, into a cinema network of, of any type or any type of releasing. And, you know, one of the examples we could look at is what happened um, in the 80s. And I go back a long time. But, uh, you know, the art house cinema in the late 80s was earning 30% of Australian box office um, to the point where it was bought out and taken over by the big um, distributors because they suddenly realised there's money there. So Art House was developed by little cinemas around the country who would get go to Cannes, they'd buy a film, they'd, they'd buy one print and they'd release that print uh, in, in a serial way around the country, the capital cities. And, you know, they built an audience and th they built that up from, you know, a number of places that Dendi was before they were sort of bought out and Natalie Miller's still doing it. Um, but they did it with often with one little cinema and they'd sometimes show a film for a year. <laughs> the Nova's doing the Nova's like, like still one of those cinemas. And in fact, yeah. some of the regional, like Backtrack Boys has done really well in the regional mm -hmm. areas. And we've gone to like the Majestic up in um, Sawtell and um, a lot of little boutique cinemas around the country where those cinemas really do, like they're fantastic. But it was really interesting going up to Darwin because they have uh, flicks in the wets up there. And the, the main cinema in town actually closed. So they only had this one weird cinema that went, so they have the outdoor cinema, but in the, in, when it's raining, which is when I was there, they had this sort of one cinema festival thing going on. But um, look, I actually, with Backtrack Boys, we actually did mix it up. We did a traditional cinema release with the alternate content, tent, and we were very much uh, doing impact stuff mixed in with that because you have to create events around those cinema releases to get people in there so that then you can spread the word. I think the other thing that used to happen in the old days is that cinemas would give films more than one week. They'd give them like two to three weeks to, to, before they'd make a decision. 
Um, and we would backtrack boys would do really well in that because our word of mouth ah, was extremely that, good. That, that is a difference. You know, yeah. ba ba backtrack boys really has great word of mouth. So, we, we, but they just don't they don't give you the time. We're all being, we're all being done over by the distributors and by the cinema. Our because distributor was trying. Yeah. Slots and, uh, you don't have a chance yeah. to get your I just want to say our distributor tried really hard. We had um, Slav working and he was also working on the Kimberley film. He, he was pushing like mad and really passionate about trying to get Backtrack Boys out there. Actually, they really, really, really... He went to bat hard because he believed in the film and he really tried. And, um, and I think he really thought that we could get um, that kind of um, audience. But it was just that we weren't given enough of a go. We still did in some places, like in Armadale, can I just say, we beat A Star Is Born in Armadale. So, you know, it, 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 because we were given a chance. But even in the beginning at Armadale, they put us on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I was like, but that's when people pick up their kids up. But anyway, yeah. obviously, it's, the farmers are having a siesta or something. How long have you gone to the cinema and then three people in the cinema to see a commercial film? Yeah. So that's because they've got eight slots in that day. But I, I think what I find a little bit devastating is that I go to the cinema now and I will see documentaries that have been made for similar budgets to the ones we're all making from overseas, given pri pride of place. Off, for example, often, in Sydney right now. Yeah. And I went to see it and there's hardly anyone in there. Yeah, but often, you know, often inferior or not stories that our audiences want to see and to me that's cultural cringe. To me that's something where we need to look at the gatekeepers again. Because why are we just apishly buying such and such a thing because it did well at midnight at the BFI, you know? Ugh, it's really depressing. Okay, we're going to wind up really soon, so I might have just one... Oh, my goodness, oh God. Um, yes, a quick question there, uh, and one at the back. Yeah. Yep. I, uh, I don't go to the cinema so much anymore. I've got like a really low tolerance to buttery popcorn and all those things. But one thing that I really used to enjoy was ABC2 had a documentary slot on Sunday night. Mm. It was like 10 o'clock Sunday night. They promoted it all week and that was, that was fantastic. And I don't need to time shift or whatever, but that was my chance just to... I knew there was going to be something awesome on Sunday night and it just kept documentaries always at the front of my mind. So if you get a meeting with the ABC, just ask for like that Sunday night slot back. Okay. So we're all the all the doco makers could stay yes. up. <laughs> it would be better if you wrote There's wrote to them I'm as sure a. I'm sure they'll say yes. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be better if you wrote to them as a member of the general public and said that because, like us saying it is, of course we're going to say that we make the stuff like <laughs> we want it on TV. But if yes. if, if the we audience we need you, mm. we need you to campaign with us and alongside us. You're the first Australian doco fan dedicated that I've ever met. I think. <laughs> 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 you know, the great thing about it's it is they can mix it up. Australian one week, French the next week. It didn't really matter, but they were big long docos. And, docos. and it was and sweet. It sounds yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. Actually, the Sunday night yeah. slot uh, is the outstock slot. Yeah. There's a question be person behind you. Yeah. I've just got a comment. Actually, two things is uh, I think the budget. Did you take into account when you said your budget as to how long and how much money you put into distribution? Because I think we talk often about what the film makes to f complete, but that's a really different thing of how many hours and how much money you're putting into distribution. So I just think that we should always kind of disclose that because I think that's a really unsaid okay, figure. So when we say that, that figure, that is only for production. That is not for distribution. It's not for any of the impact stuff that we do afterwards, which is unpaid. And uh, or if you're lucky enough to team up with, um, a, you know, a philanthropic foundation that can sort of create an impact producer to work with you. But you, you usually get paid not very much as a filmmaker, even though you're working 16 hours a day at that moment when that film's going out. So you have to be sort of uh, a little bit crazy, really. And that 500,000, by the way, for Backtrack Boys. That was quite a low budget because I had to travel a lot and everything. But also, um, that I, I, I had to do like multiple roles. And I tell you, I hate producing. 
and I never want to do it again. And, um, <laughs> and um, you know, so I had to do that. I had to shoot the film. I had to, you know, do about four different jobs. I even was like the edit assistant at one point just because, like, we didn't have... You know, it, it's quite... And I, I liked... I mean, I also created 18 jobs, by the way. I don't want to... You know, I, there was a lot of people that worked on that film, so I feel like I'm a job creator. So, um, but you know, yeah, th those low budgets reflect um, a lot of unpaid labour on many levels. So, our budget, our marketing budget, which was in, um, in the budget, it was about 20 grand, 30 grand, but that's not quaffable. So it's just kind of, but, it's not even realistic. but the math, the math, and it was nowhere near enough. It doesn't factor in time. But the math that um, that I was told many years ago was that if you want to make a million dollars at the office, you have to spend a third of that in marketing. So that's yeah. so if you want to make a hundred thou, you're going to spend thirty cash advertising. You know all of that. So it's um, and that without that kind of algorithm, there you're probably just pushing. But you it did it. You did it with embrace. So there's a new way of creating the audience, right? I mean, that's the old distribution model, and that's true. And to compete with American imports, you have to somehow match their publicity budgets. But you guys managed to. It wasn't film, us. It was well, Taran. Uh, yeah, Taran, sure. Taran, sure. But what yeah. I'm saying is, that's sort of what the a wonderful. That makes the rule. Yeah, but yeah. What, a, what a wonderful hack to hold on to that it is possible to create a huge sure. audience bypassing the old model using social media. You've just got to be smart and maybe have a little bit of fairy dust with you, right? It's also true, I mean, the idea that social media is cheap and free advertising is really not true. Like, it might have been a few years ago, like quite a few years ago, but um, it's not. There's a lot of other people out there in that working in that space, and the algorithms are now configured in such a way that you really have to pay to play, and oh. that's very clearly established by the people who know what they're doing. Like, there were some excellent people at World Congress a couple of years ago in San Francisco who did a panel there that I helped chair and they the kind of depth of understanding they had of how those platforms work was astounding and I came over with several takeaways which is that social media takes as much planning and kind of strategy as any kind of marketing um, and it involves money and it involves people who are experienced and able to deliver and, and manage and like respond very quickly to those campaigns so it's not like you just it's not free. Set and forget. Mm. Yeah. And can and, I just say this whole, the, the whole fan force model, because we're doing it right now. And I think everyone's under this illusion that somehow if you just like book a cinema and you just put it out on Facebook, somehow everyone's going to miraculously run into the cinema and it's going to be happening. It actually takes a lot more work than that to get those fan force screenings happening. You know, um, you know, you have to contact organisations, you have to get some key people to sort of spread the word. It's, Facebook doesn't miraculously just deliver people into the audiences for you. Um, it's, this, it's, it's, it's much, you have to do a lot more work than that. And so I think there's a bit of an illusion that, that you just sort of book a cinema, send out a Facebook thing to all your friends in an email and that's it and somehow it's all going to no, happen. You, you need it doesn't traction, happen like that. For yeah, sure. you just, need it's a lot of work. So can I suggest that you add those uh, unpaid hours and that budget into your disclosure of what your film costs because I sort of think it's not quite true for people who are starting to think that that's actually what it's going to cost. Okay, well My second thing is million. yeah, 1.2 million. Yeah. Films. So let's say 1.2 because I think that's probably true and a lot of unpaid hours. The second little point just to say is that when even what you're doing with WeChat and stuff which I think is fantastic, these are like new products you're making which cost again on top of this. So let's talk about you're bending over backwards to find audiences and you're paying more to find an audience. So you're not making one product like a handbag that sells. You're making like 20 products to sell across those platforms. So that's sort of just these other costs and times and stuff that you keep bending, that we all have to keep bending over backwards for to make. It was just two things I heard that I thought I'd add. Yes, bending I mean, over backwards is, is, you've said that a few times and I can relate to that. Do you know, um, like, <laughs> I would love to end this on a more positive note. Yeah, let's like, be positive. I'd like to have some positivities to it. Like, one yeah. is, yeah. please get involved please. politically with the group that's formed around documentary issues specifically, and Tom's kind of can lead or send out information about that. Join the Make It Australian campaign. Please, please write or call your local members federally and 
statewide to say where's the arts money like if enough people do that and if, if cinema and demand if we could use the cinema and demand model and you could all go out and get 30 friends to write the letter or ring that would be really helpful um, and look the other one is and just on a per totally anecdotal level like 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 you know kind of evolve or die I suppose has been our other mantra in the office which is that we keep trying different things you know because that's what else can we do sometimes a broadcast pathway is the best one sometimes some kind of philanthropic pathway is the best sometimes there's a rare chance that a feature like just directly feature funded film there are some doing it I had a conversation with the J Japanese broadcaster and they, they do have a feature slot they just want things originating on 4k it's like okay like <laughs> content does that matter just 4k if, the, if that's the gateway we'll, we can probably do that which has led me to you know, like consider like I guess have a bit of a kind of a lens on what what can we get up and so this year I seem to be funding uh, pitching things that are involved dogs and space which is one project a virtual reality experience a virtual reality experience and you know several other things which are kind of a bit obviously brought out of our own interest in certain issues but kind of with an eye to well what what can we do to kind of l link into existing audiences that will help us kind of create kind of a, a perception of kind of there's an audience for us to whoever we're funding it to. So maybe that's, that's another part of the puzzle, you know. More funding, absolutely. I think dedicated slots on TV would be an enormous uh, help in developing, re refinding the Australian audience, mm. but also subject matter, like just having some fun with like the, the odd set of kind of I don't know, the ecology that's out there right now, it will change again for sure. So, you know, give it a shot. Yeah, thank you. Just a final comment from me. You mentioned dogs, you mentioned pets. There's, mm. I mean, one thing we didn't talk about is ultra, ultra low um, mm. feature films. And there was a filmmaker I worked with last year called uh, Mary Zanazi, who made a film about dogs called Dogs of Democracy. Mm. Now, that film, she essentially funded herself. But mm. because we've got this wonderful program at Screen Australia called PEP, she was able to get 20% of her budget, which meant that she could probably do her post-production and make the film look really nice for something that she'd shot herself on a camera worth $2,000, essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that film's gone around the world mm -hmm. film festivals and played uh, here in, in cinemas in Australia. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can start small, you can start with, with your own equipment and make a film that ends up you know, some in, in, in a really major place. Mm -hmm. You've got to obviously work hard, and one thing that uh, Diane Wayman said at a um, documentary conference in Melbourne, passion is the thing that sort of really, you, you, you need the, the passion. You need the passion, but also you need to tell a good story. You've got to be a storyteller, you know, and you can practice that. But that's, as people said here in the panel, storytelling, the ability to tell good stories is so important. And also to have good characters. That, they can be animals, you're right. But, but ideally people with the animals. <laughs> <laughs> More than just animals. And um, before we sign off, Pat's got an announcement. Oh, it's not really an announcement, but we just um, <laughs> want to say happy birthday. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. It's a cake you can eat. Thank you to Tom for putting this together.